Sir? I'm looking for a job. In fact, I've made up my mind to find a career that I can learn and grow into. Who am I? I'm a hard worker. I set high goals and I've been told that I'm persistent. Now I'm not fooling myself, sir. Having been raised with the self-esteem movement so popular in schools, I used to expect my needs to be considered. But I know that today's work culture no longer caters to the job loyalty that could be promised to earlier generations. What I believe, sir, is that good things come to those who work their asses off. And that good people, such as yourself, who reached the top of the mountain, didn't just fall there. My motto is, if you want to win the lottery, you have to make the money to buy a ticket. You have to make the money to buy a ticket. You have to make the money to buy a ticket! Hand me the keys, you fucking cocksucker. Number two, step forward. Give me the fucking keys, you fucking cocksucker, motherfucker! Knock it off, get back. Number three, step forward. <laughs> Hand me the keys, you cocksucker. In English, please. Excuse me. In English. I mean the fucking keys. You can't talk. What the fuck? <laughs> Number four. Step forward. <laughs> Alive. What's going on, guys? Good intro, bro. The great. Yeah. Hell yeah. 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 That was great. How's everybody doing? Doing great. Yep. How about you? Doing great. Doing good, man. I'm doing good. Um, back with another top five. So, um. You guys have a hard time with this one? I could do um, about, I don't even know, like 10 more of these uh, streams. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> I've got like a stack um, of movies over to the side here. Like, they're all like favorite thrillers of mine, just a whole pile. The, the biggest problem I have with this, get ready for this stream, is there's so many different subgenres of thrillers. You got action thrillers, you know, yep. suspense thrillers, psychological thrillers. And as I'm watching some of these movies that I ain't seen in a while, you know, I'm watching this like, you know, I'm getting more drama than I am thriller out of this. And immediately it kind of drops off my list. And um, I have quite a few of those. Or even like you get more horror than yeah. thriller. Like, you know, yeah. if you watch Silence of Lambs, they, everyone loves to call that a thriller. To me, that's a horror movie. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, you know, or Seven, 
another one, another great example of uh, what they consider a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece, but is it a horror movie? Is it a thriller? I think it leans more to horror. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm uh, TV's no help because a lot of these I went on and you know usually I have a genre like comedy. It'll be like mm -hmm. sci-fi, thriller, action, whatever the fuck. There'll be like nine different subgenres. Yeah, listen for some of these movies. So, I noticed that too. Yeah, and it's like thriller, like you said, falls into so many. It falls into like mystery, drama, action, horror. I mean, it falls into every genre basically. So yeah. So I yeah. think this is more than any of the other ones. If it's a thriller to you, it's a thriller. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's why we need to look at it. I guess. Oh, well, you got you got. I mean, there's so many. Like you were saying though, you get the mystery, suspense. Yep action revenge you got the sex thriller i mean there's just so many different in the 90s was thick yeah. with those fuck thrillers you know yeah. so yeah. i mean uh, there there it, it really is it's we could have probably done a top five revenge thriller a top five action thriller a top five yeah but you know then we would have definitely had more you know commonality Front. in the picks so it was kind of yeah. easier yeah. better to leave it this way uh, yeah but this we could just Anthony's do an idea so this was Anthony's idea, so if it sucks, then... Right. It's all on Anthony, so we have nothing to worry about. If it sucks, everybody blame Anthony. Yeah, exactly. So. And this is one we could easily do a round two of. Oh, There's yeah. so many thrillers like we talked about. We yeah. could easily do another one of these, you know, part two. So I'm going to check out the chat. So all we got, we got 25 people watching. Cool. Appreciate everybody being here. What's up, Cave, man? I hope you're feeling better, man. Hey, guy. What's going on, man? Yeah, What's up, man? Guy? Chris, what's going on? Even all slash the like button. Appreciate it. Bunch of haze back and forth. We got Wild Wrangler in the house. What's going on, Wild Wrangler? Angler. What's up, man? Wrangler. Magic hands. What's up, Magic? Uzi Suicide 666. Cool name. What's going on? Got a thick like that. <laughs> you guys be sure to um let us know in the chat man, what you what you guys pick, man. So maybe I'll get some good recommendations tonight. What's going on, John Doe? Hey Jeff. Jeff. Wild Wrangler, Pops and Crew are back. It's been a while since we've done the top five. It's been, it has you know, been a while. Yeah. I thought, I thought we did the last one. Alan was busy. Anthony's had some stuff to take care of. It's just been a while to get to back. Johnny was going to be here tonight. Uh, Johnny got called in for work emergency, so uh, uh, he's not about it. But, but I've been That's talking about it. My head last month was working a lot. Yeah. So I definitely understand that. What's hey, going Corey. on, buddy? Corey? Sydney, and all those great questions. What's going on, man? Everybody drink. Well, Sydney. Sydney's, <laughs> Sydney's favorite genre has to be thriller. He should be on here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sydney, you definitely should be on this screen. <laughs> on this top five. Yeah. Sure. Saying, hey, Holland. What's going on, Holland? Yeah. Hey, Holland. The stream has officially started. What's up, man? Yep. Allie, what's going on? Hey, Allie. Hey, Allie. No, no we're, we try to start at 11. I think we were, we were pretty close to on time tonight. You might be making a joke about the intros being long as hell. Usually, <laughs> right. it might, it might be. It might be. get through all the haze here. Oh, blissful what was a name I don't recognize, but what's up? I see you in chats. Yeah. Okay. You I appreciate you being here. Yep. Mama Blue Ray, what's going on? Mama going Blue Ray. Chris, how you doing? Hey, hey Chris. Chris. What up? Everybody's still saying hey back and forth. Make sure I ain't missing the questions or anything. Don't worry. Sydney will start posting them later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> Number one weekend at Bernie's. Good pick. Yeah. <laughs> it is thrilling. Brent, what's going on, man? Hey, Brent. Hey, so, Brent. Brent, did you end up keeping your, um, your fucking $70 shark or are you selling it? I decided to keep mine. It's a cool looking piece, man. I mean, that's expensive, but it's a cool looking piece for sure. Yeah. And I was hoping it was going to be out of stock, whatever. But um, on Mondo's website, they're still selling it for 70 bucks. I said, I'll just keep it. Yeah. You said they had different colors too. That well, that's the one it? they have out right now. I think they've released some in the past that are different different looks. Yeah. That's the only one they're doing. I think they do maybe one. I like, I don't know. It's the first time I ever looked at them. But I've seen some online that were from Mondo that were similar to this, but just different colors. So, fuck, like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Chris says deep cover. I'll put that on the list. Mm. Again, says got my 4Ks for Blood on Satan's Claw and Witchfinder General on um, the other day from uh, by 88 Films. 
Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Nice, man. My well, Blu-ray said it'll be hard to pick five. Yeah, it was not, definitely not easy. Yeah. What's up, Trey? Trey. Hey, Trey. Uh, Sydney says, I have 200 thrillers listed. To cut down to five is insanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Ben says, I consider identity more of a thriller than a horror. I do as well. Yeah, exactly. So it just, like I said, depends. Some lean further either way. Just if it's a thriller, it's a thriller. Yeah. Chris says, newer type of thriller I do like. Fatal with uh, Fatal with Hillary Swank, Dressed to Kill. Another great one from De Palma and Obsession. Yeah. The Palmas are big in the thrillers. Yeah. Excited for the new announced After Dark 3 box from Australia out in June. I wonder what's in that. Yeah, I haven't looked. I've seen that it was coming out, but I haven't seen what was in it. What's going on, Nick? You ever seen a movie called 68 Kill? Yes, I have. I have it over there. Um, yeah, it was a very enjoyable blind watch. I had a good yeah. time with it. It's a good one. Yeah, I had a good time with it. It looked as a uh, 68 kills kind of crazy. It is. It's a wild one for sure, but it's, it was a good time. So he says, are we doing honorable mentions tonight? No, probably not. Because like Anthony said a minute ago, this is one we could definitely do another one on. So in yeah. case we decide later on to do another one, we'll save those honorable mentions for part two. But feel yeah, free Chris. to throw your top fives in the chat. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, let's see them. Yeah. Yeah, Chris says Ricochet with my man John Lithgow. You yeah, know, they need uh, we need to get a really nice release of that movie, man. Yeah, I agree one hundred percent. I just watched that for the first time actually like a month ago and yeah, I loved it. It's fantastic. Yeah, man, it's a good one, man. Yeah. And Brent said he decided to keep his his jaws. Yeah, I mean it looks cool. Why not? I mean it was seventy dollars cool, but it, it looks <laughs> No, yeah, that's that's pricey for, that, for sure. Nah. Yeah, but it does look badass. <laughs> I've never uh, seen somebody like so the- disappointed with themselves. <laughs> my I mean, I'm blaming Brent for it. We were doing a stream. I think Brent's the one that mentioned it to me. And I don't know. I guess I was drinking or I, I was in the right mood, that right, whatever. Had extra money to piss away in the bank. And I just said, fuck it, I order it. A year later, it comes in. So it'd be all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris says, watch one you can pull in the thriller category. Uh, not school. Not show. Nice. Nick of Time River Phoenix. Right, so you guys find the in store only Mondo still books. Mine had them, but only two per store. Uh not online apparently, Walmart exclusives. Oh, you mean like uh Dread was one of them, I know. Um yeah, I've seen them in store. I've only seen those on like uh or in Best Buy, but I'm I'm not sure yeah, if they like, have some Walmart, Walmart carries now. them now. I think I have a couple of those. I think I'd have to go out there and look and see what. Get a yeah, there's yeah, a cool. Got. There's a cool Reservoir Dogs one. Yeah, that year. No, no, that's that, that's the Lionsgate one. Lionsgate. But then there, there's a Mondo version of the Reservoir Dogs uh, huh. steel book that looks really badass too. Oh uh, um, yeah, I've got a, I've got like a Mondo steel book of uh, Nightcrawler and uh, I think. Pet Cemetery. Uh, I've got the okay. Pet Cemetery one. I want that Nightcrawler one though. That's a really cool. What's up, Kylo? I'm not sure. I think I might have missed you, but what's up, Kylo? Hey, Superman. Steve okay. Mars, what's going on, buddy? What's up, Steve? What's up, man? All right, we got our first question of the night. Chris had another one. DMA, that's a good one too. I ain't seen that on a while. That's a good one. All right, first question: Who was your favorite actress that you had a crush on? All right, I got to be really careful how I answer this question. <laughs> the last yeah, time I, yeah. this I mean, mine is obviously going to be Gal Gadot, whatever. <laughs> Gal Gadot's my number one. So, <laughs> I'm going to say know, Sarah. She... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. No, no I'm good. That's all I got to say. I'm going to talk for an hour about it if you want to. <laughs> but go ahead. I was going to say uh, Sarah Michelle Geller was definitely my crush back in the day. For sure. Cruel Intentions, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, just goes, the list goes on and on. I'm struggling here. Favorite actress? I, I don't know. It'll come to me. Yeah, I don't know. Elvira. Like, that was probably, like, my first crush growing up. Oh, yeah. yeah. She don't like you. 
<laughs> barking up the wrong tree. You got, oh, you got, yeah, you got yeah, that shit broke my fucking heart last year. <laughs> you got the wrong <laughs> what happened, man? Did you go to like get her autograph and she said fuck off or something? No, no, she, she, uh, she's she a came lesbian out last year. Oh, she's been no, in a, yeah. a lesbian relationship for like uh, something like 20 years or something. Yeah, apparently it's the worst kept secret ever. Like, she always traveled with the same woman and everything. Yeah, it's her. This is my friend. Her fitness yeah. trainer. Yeah. <laughs> always here with me. Uh, okay, man's name off every every thriller in the book. Frantic there's the Ford, other good one. There's a million Harrison Ford ones. You could do all. Yeah, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, Michael Ford. Douglas. Michael yeah. Douglas. Did about yeah. yeah, that's pretty much what he. That's what he specialized yeah. in, in the nineties. Through all these here, uh, Chris says his mind Sandra Bullock. Yeah, she's she's a looker too. Absolutely, yeah. Uzi said, "Live and die in L.A." I saw the devil falling down, man. I fucking love fall. I love. I saw the devil too. Um, oh, falling man. down, man. That's I love falling down. Yeah, yeah, love it. Craig, what's going on, man? Craig, yeah, fear, yeah, man. Ninety-six favorite thriller. Yeah, strong thriller. Yeah. Okay, this is a hard question because it's hard to pinpoint the first crush. Was this question first. the first crush or it wasn't first? It was just favorite. Okay. Mm, yeah. Yeah, Elvira is definitely my first like crush. So everybody in the chat's getting excited now. Yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. Chris's Sounds goofy ass good. Jessica Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the honesty. Oh, Chris and his tunes. Yep. Damn, this rolling. That's like a thriller. Uh, yeah. I mean, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is actually a thriller. Anyway, if you remember, it gets pretty oh, yeah. dark. It does. Nice. It definitely does. Yeah. I'm going to mark it right there. And um, we're going to get started with our first one. And I guess, Brad, you are up first. You got Let Anthony go first. I got to finish up this note, these notes real quick. Word up. All right. Go ahead, Steve. All right. Well, <clears throat> uh, like uh, Brad pointed out, I guess I went the hipster route. I didn't completely understand the assignment. So for me, it's not. Well, I'll still stand by these. These will be uh, up there in my top thrillers, but it won't be any uh, movies that you'll hear anybody else talk about tonight, I'm sure. Um, so my number five, that'll be uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Oh, that's a good one. Yorgos Lanthimos. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. All right. So, yeah, it came out in uh, 2017, two hours, one minute. Uh, IMDb uh, rating of a 7.0. Uh, Colin Farrell, Nicole Kidman, and uh, Barry Keoghan. Um, yeah. The Joker. But, yeah, as well as uh, Alicia Silverstone. This is like the first movie she had really, I'd seen her pop up in uh, like this in The Lodge. She just kind of fell off the map. Um, but uh, yeah, like the whole setup for this movie, um, Colin Farrell is a heart surgeon. And uh, this movie probably is, it's going to be a little divisive. It's not for everybody. Um, it's a slow burn. Uh everything is kind of filmed like from weird dutch angles kind of uh everybody talks in like a weird like cadence uh <laughs> so yeah speech is weird people act like a little aloof um so i don't Everybody's know it, on volume. It, yeah <laughs> it, it just kind of stuck out to me the first time i watched it i was staying at a friend's house uh they only had netflix so I just kind of like threw it on and it just come out. And uh, I didn't know if I liked it or hated it like when I first watched it, but it stuck with me and I ended up going back and watching it. But uh, yeah, it, it's about Colin Farrell. He's a heart surgeon. He's a family man. He's got a wife, Nicole Kidman. He's got two kids. Um, and he's meeting up with this teenager like a couple of times a week, usually played by Barry Kilgan um uh just hanging out with them generally like you know doing like uh, i don't know big brother stuff or whatever um and later on it's kind of revealed in the in the movie after he invites uh 
this kid over to his house to have dinner with his family that uh uh colin farrell was uh this kid's father's surgeon and he died on the uh operation table uh there's uh something uh, going around thinking that uh colin farrell might have been drinking a little bit when he was uh performing the operation and uh the whole story isn't really even revealed and laid out until about 50 minutes in um colin farrell's son starts feeling sick um and uh there are four steps that uh, Barry Kilgan lays out to Colin Farrell's character. Uh, paralysis of limbs, they're not going to, his kids aren't going to be able to walk. Uh, refusal to eat to the point of starvation. Uh, at this point, like his uh, son is refusing to eat anything. Uh, bleeding from the eyes, and then he's told a couple, uh, he, he doesn't have much time after the eyes start bleeding. They're, they're going to die soon. Uh, but it's basically laid out to Colin Farrell that he needs to choose, uh, either his wife or one of his children to die or else all three of them are going to die basically to punish him for, uh, his father dying, uh, during the operation that he performed. And, uh, yeah, I don't, it just kind of gets kooky from there, but, uh, oh, from there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it, it's very weird. It's very, yeah. I, it doesn't really necessarily ne make sense. Nothing's explained. Yeah, he's um, like a, a warlock or something. He's a gypsy or a warlock or something. He can curse the family. I don't. It just doesn't. It know, never really uh, says, does it? Yeah, it doesn't no. really say. But that's you yes. know, you're you're just you kind of just make it up yeah. your own. What the hell's going on there? yeah but um yeah like it or hate it i mean it's it's worth checking out uh the performances are solid um the cinematography is really good the direction's really good but yeah i don't know how they got colin farrell to do it but uh him and nicole kidman it, it is a really good movie it's really bizarre and that barry keegan guy is just how to, like really unhinged and strange and he just goes He's like, you know, I really like, I really like fires. Maybe we should just skip the fires. It's just like, kid, I'm trying to fucking work this out. Will you give me a fucking minute? You know, it's like, the, yeah. oh, it was just strange, man. It's a really strange. But he ends up get, he's like, I like your watch. He just gives him the watch. <laughs> just like, yeah. please stop. Whatever, anything I can do to stop this. Yeah. It, 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 I don't know. It, it's a very odd movie and it's not going to be for everybody, but uh, yeah. If you're in the mood for something independent and artsy, give it a shot. Nice, man. Very cool. Brad, Brad you ready? You want Anthony to go next? Let we'll, we'll Anthony go. I'm still trying right, to Anthony, you up, buddy. All right. If I let you go, do you think you can fly? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> man, I just rewatched this. It has been a long time since I've uh, revisited this one. And I... You know, you forget just how good Macaulay Culkin is. And Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood's excellent in this. Yeah. He's, they're both young kids. Kid. Like, I mean, it's just insane. I mean, Macaulay Culkin in this movie is only 13. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's even creepier. Yeah. Uh, he had already done Home Alone and Home Alone 2. And now he's doing this movie in 93. Um, but yeah, for people that haven't seen it, Elijah Wood, his mother passes away. So his dad takes him to uh, go stay with his aunt and uncle. Um, and, you know, basically because he has to go over to Japan for business. And once he completes his business in two weeks, he'll have enough money and he'll be set to uh, take care of his son, Elijah Wood, uh, you know, without basic, without having to go back to work, basically, which works out really well. Because, I, I, you know, he wants to be with his son. He just lost his mother to cancer. It was tragic and stuff. So. And you get this cool, there's like a little road trip moment because Elijah Wood and his father live out in Arizona and now they're taking a road trip to Maine. 
so you get to see like the beautiful like desert and like how warm it is and hot and everything and then you go to like the cold water you know like a, a whole different landscape you know i mean you got the beautiful water because they live like right off of uh, the lake and it's like snowing too so it's just very you go from hot to cold and it just it, visually it looks really nice so i like that transition it's a transition too because you're going from warmth and love to now cold bitterness you know evil in a way so i like that um and yeah, so Macaulay Culkin is Elijah Wood's cousin. And at first, everything seems great. Elijah Wood and him are getting along. They're playing. They're having fun. They're laughing like kids do, roughhousing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But then Elijah Wood just starts doing all this really creepy shit. Like he builds this crossbow that shoots these bolts and he like starts aiming it at this cat and elijah wood's like well don't just scare the cat don't hit the cat and he's like okay and he shoots the bolt and it misses the cat and he's like oh i gotta fix like the targeting on this or whatever i got or i gotta fix like the scope on this or something because it was it's like oh he didn't mean to miss he was aiming for the cat he just you know just wasn't lined up properly he's like oh, i gotta adjust it um so then later on there's a dog that he doesn't like and he lines that up with the crossbow and kills the dog and you're like holy shit so you're you're off to the races after that because then they both have to hide the body of the dog in this well and that's really it's creepy a huge too. dog it's a huge yeah. dog too. oh yeah, yeah. Little kids. yeah big dog for sure and yeah it's not like some little puppy i mean it was it was like a guard dog kind of you know um that like walked around the dock but so that was really creepy then you get the scene you know i don't want to spoil too much but it's just i love they they do such a great job of making macaulay culkin like you know a psychopath like just this you know he just has no emotions or whatever and it's weird because i can't even think of too many mm -hmm. other movies where you just watch this kid do these horrendous things over and over like this you know the, the movie i want to see is uh, Macaulay, Cal Macaulay Culkin's character from The Good Son and Home Alone when they try to break in the house. Yes. That's what I want to see. I want to see his evil yeah. ass just fuck him up. Kevin well, McAllister a little bit more devious. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> great. But yeah, really, but then, games is kind of that, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. That's a good one. Right. But then he builds this dummy that he calls Mr. Freeway and he takes <laughs> that and once again, Elijah Wood has no clue what they're doing. And he takes this dummy that looks like a person, kind of, you know, he made it up to look like an actual guy. And then he just pushes it off the free, you know, off the, the bridge onto the, onto the freeway. And then all these cars just crash and pile up and stuff. And, he, and you know, once again, Macaulay's just not showing any emotion at all. He's like, oh, I didn't mean to do it. Oh, you know, just playing it off like it was an accident. I was just trying to have some fun or whatever. It's It's beyond creepy. I mean, it really is. He does a fantastic job. Uh, and Elijah Wood, once again, does such a good job playing like the, like, he's just trying to figure out how to, you know, he just lost his mother to cancer. Now he's with this fucking psychopath kid, you know, and he's just trying to, like, how do I get out of this situation? <laughs> and he's trying to protect um, his other cousin, Macaulay Culkin's sister, uh, who actually is Macaulay Culkin. It's either his sister or cousin or something in real life. Her, her name's Connie. It's a sister. It's a sister. It's a sister, yeah. yeah. Which I thought was cool because I was going to say she looks just like him, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so Elijah Wood's trying to protect her, <laughs> you know, because Macaulay Culkin is already, we've seen him do some other bad stuff, you know, and, you, you know, now he's, he's you know, worried that he's going to hurt his own sister or his mother or anyone else. So he's constantly watching Macaulay. And uh, I just think they do a great job of showing a lot of the characteristics of like a serial killer in Macaulay Culkin to the point where yeah. it's like, it's very eerie and unsettling because they, because he even, there's a scene even where it reveals that Macaulay Culkin had a trophy that he kept hidden, you know? And then when the person finds out, like, oh, you had this, it's just like, holy shit, he even takes trophies. <laughs> like, this a real trophy. serial killer, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, he's a real fucking serial killer. I mean, he's, he's a serial killer, like, in the making. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's some other terrible things he does. But the other thing I wanted to say, too, is that um, this movie's rated R, and there's very little blood in it and there's like only one f-bomb you know where macaulay culkin says elijah what he's like 
don't fuck with me, Mark. You know, I'm just like, oh. (laughs) My favorite scene of it. It was so weird to see him play that, say that, you know, after Home Alone and shit. Yeah. But that was the only F bomb. So basically, this movie, from what I was reading on it and everything, was just rated R because of how, you know, the content. The content. That dark subject matter of a kid who's 13. Doing all this stuff, I mean, it's just that that's it. It's just rated R based and on that. They probably didn't want all the, all the parents bringing their kids to see a Macaulay Culkin picture. Yeah, like that's a fucking other Home Alone type movie or something, you know. Rated R, they got to pay attention to it, I guess. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, probably it even right. says it says rated R for acts of violence and terror involving a disturbed child. That's why it's rated R. <laughs> it's yeah. like, Jesus Christ. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my pick, man. I, I love the good son. It was excellent. It, it, it still holds up to this day. Um, yeah, just definitely. Yeah, good. Great. Yeah. Man. All right. Uh, my number five, a little disclaimer. I, I discarded all the Fincher stuff. I think Fincher's a master of thrillers, but I did like a full on stream about Fincher movies. And I just, there's, I don't want to rehash. At least three of them would be in my top five for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, just uh, like I said, I left some of that stuff. I, I, again, I left some of the other stuff out too. Like Sans Lambs, I still think leans more horror than thriller. So it's all subjective. I left that off too. But uh, anyway, my number five, uh, the diversity hire. Oh boy. Um, Ooh, nice. You know, this is the textbook revenge thriller. This is a movie I believe really put foreign film on the map in the early 2000s. You know, that they, they really let them, you know, the world know that you could take a foreign film seriously. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of comedic elements in it too. If you if you rewatch, if you haven't watched it recently, it's actually pretty funny too. But uh, 2003, I don't know who directed it. Uh, I'm not even going to try to butcher. It's a Korean guy, uh, Michael Kikwan, whatever. Um, this is a really good release, by the way, if you haven't uh, picked this up. It's got a full-length, two-hour documentary on the making of. Um, I like this, and I like the remake. I would recommend watching them both. Uh, ignore some of the people. There's some some things in this that are better than the original. There's some things that are in this that are better than the remake. It all depends on what you uh, prefer. But I can tell you this. This one has the better villain, Shorto Coplay. So uh, if you like if you like Charles Copley, this is probably the route to go. But basically, it follows uh, this guy who's this drunken bastard philanderer, just a complete and total asshole. And uh, he buys a gift for his daughter. He ends up in jail, and his friend has to go bail him out. And he's just completely and totally obnoxious. He's just you know acting a fool at this jail cell, and he gets kidnapped for no reason, no explanation given, and he's in prison for 15 years. In a hotel room, just basically uh, what looks like a hotel room, but it's just a concrete room, no escape. There's some great gags in there. He's trying to learn to fight, and he's trying to, like, make the most of his time. Uh, he, he sticks his head out the head shoot at one time, and they kind of just sweep his head, head back in with the with his foot. Oh, that, that scene always cracks me up. Um, he's really good at this actor is really good at being kind of pathetic and somewhat of a badass at the same time. But uh, he kind of cleans up his act and, um, you know, vows to break out and get revenge. And just as he's breaking through the wall, they let him go for no reason. They, never, they don't give any explanation. They just let him go. And it's an odyssey of revenge. He has to try to find out what the fuck. Why did anybody even – he doesn't even know. So many people hate him. He doesn't even know where to look as far as to who would want him – would do this to him. So uh, in the process, he's framed for murder of his wife that's killed. It, 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 like I said, it's a revenge odyssey. That's the best word for it. It's got a lot of uh, action in it. Um, and like I said, he's been in basically locked in a room for 15 years. So he's he's not the best at it, but he's he's one thing. He's tough. He's definitely tough. And uh, like he he was punching the, the brick wall for years to make his hands hard if he ever got a hold of the guy and stuff like that. And there there's a scene where he finally gets a gets a hold of one of the henchmen that uh, imprisoned him to get information on him. He starts taking his teeth out with a hammer, which is pretty cool. And, you know, that henchman comes back later <laughs> with a whole mouthful of gold teeth. I don't know, man. It's, it is a lot of fun. And uh, for a revenge thriller, that's an odyssey. It is very dark also. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. It's, it's not like it's just fun, but this, this actor, whatever his name is, 
um, goes all in with this. You know, a lot of Asian actors. He reminds me of the good old the Chinese Cat 3 actors that just go all out. Like, there's a scene where he eats an octopus, a live octopus right on camera. And, uh, you know, just doesn't even flinch, just goes right through it. So, I mean, it, it is a, it's a bloody, really violent uh, movie. Um, shot really, really well, really stylized, almost feels like a criterion. Like I said, if you're, I, I'd watch both. I like both. Um, like some of them, you know, I like Josh Brolin. I, I think it's a wash between the leads, but I think this movie carry has a little bit better ending and a, and a way better villain. Um, the ending in this, it's a little almost Disney. I don't like how I'm like almost as a happy ending. That one's not so happy, but yeah, uh, probably explain this movie terribly. I, everybody has seen this thing. It's a, uh, <coughs> it's, it's one of those, uh, yeah, it's one of those early 2000 revenge thrillers that was, you know, kind of running around everywhere. But, uh, yeah, check it out if you haven't seen it. Good pick, man. Um, my number five would be on nobody's list, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> this is a lot of nostalgia for me. Um, this is from 1988 and Shoot to Kill. I remember you reviewed um, that. I still haven't seen it. Yeah, I got a, I got a review of this on my kind of a deep dive on my channel. So you guys check that out. But, um, so it even says they're red hot thriller at the top. I just noticed that. Um, yeah, you got um, Tom Berenger, Sidney Poitier, Kirstie Alley, and Clancy Brown. I love Clancy Brown. Um, the premise of this basically, this thing starts off right off the bat, whatever, is just high tense thriller, uh, the high tense thrill ride. You got a jewel heist going on, and they do it in a really unique fucking way, a way I've never seen it before, um, which, which starts off right off the bat, you're invested. The guy that basically um, did the jewel house and did some pretty heinous shit, whatever, he's trying to make it to the Canadian border. And on the way to the Canadian border, um, there's a roadblock. He has to take a side dirt road. He ends up hooking up with this um, this, this party of guys, whatever, that are going, that have got that have a guide, and they're going on a hike up into the mountains right on the Canadian border. And he's trying to maybe get on this hike, whatever, and get over the border to, to Canada, trying to get away from the law. And so you go from the, you got the jewel heist, you go to a, a, um, a, like a survival story out in the woods. You have Kirstie Alley with like five or six guys. And at this time, you have no idea what the, what the killer looks like. And so there's five or six guys with Kirstie Alley. A whole of them seem like regular Joe guys, weekend warrior type guys. And you don't know which one of these guys are the, are the, are the killer. And so for a good, good piece of the movie, you don't, know which, you don't know which one is the bad guy. You can't really tell. And they all kind of drop hints. A guy will make an evil look, whatever. This other guy will say something kind of kind of weird. You, you're trying to figure out who the killer is. And then once you find out who the killer is, it's done in a way that's like, fuck. Um, mm -hmm. So it's done really well. And, of course, um, Tom Berenger is Kirstie Alley's boyfriend. And him and her have got kind of this tour guide going through the mountains thing together. And he finds out that Kirstie Alley got, um, has got somebody in her party that's a killer. Sidney Poitier goes and tracks him down. And so the two of them, you got Sidney Poitier from New York, City Boy. And you got Mr. Country Boy, Tom Berenger, Mr. Survivalist, that, that are that are teaming up, whatever, to go out into the woods to kind of chase after Kirstie Alley to try to save her before this guy goes and kills everybody. Um, and the, the, the um, back and forth with these two guys here, they fucking hate each other. Tom Berenger said, you're just going to slow me down. Um, Sidney Portier says, I'm an FBI agent. Fuck you. I'm going with you. That kind of deal. So they kind of hate each other. And, of course, um, some of the shit that goes in the, in the wilderness stuff is pretty intense. So it's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun to watch. Um, back when I was a kid, man, I say kid, I was a teenager. Um, I used to watch this bitch all the fucking time. I can't believe we only got a fucking DVD release of this. I don't find very many DVDs. And I finally had to break down and buy this one DVD because you can't find it to watch anywhere else. Um, so like if you get this for like six bucks, well, you, you need to pick it up if you've never seen it. It is a fucking blast, whatever. And as far as a thriller goes, I had to put it in my top five because from the very first frame to the very end, the whole fucking movie just, it don't fucking let up. Um, and you got everything. You got you got fucking um, the jewel heist. You got the survival stuff, which is done pretty fucking well. Um, you end up back in the city, whatever. At the end of the movie, you know, kind of Tom Berenger ends up on on his stomping grounds, where he's this big bad FBI agent, and he's a city boy, never leaves the woods. Now he's in New York City, so you kind of get both sides of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've always loved this movie, man. It's a, it's a fucking blast. Kino Lorber needs to put this out on a 4K release. Is what we fucking need. So that's my number five. <laughs> Yeah, that's a Kino written all over it from sound. Yeah, over. I could see that. Yeah. All right. And that's why I never hear fucking anybody talk about. Yeah. 
And I did I the I review of it, it, and nobody watched it. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I guess I'm gonna stay behind it, man. That's a good one. <clears throat> All right, Craig saying, "What's up, ladies? What's going on, Craig?" Craig, Craig. Okay, Sorry. Craig. <laughs> Are we talking about hot women now? Well, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, Uzi said, "Deadly Outlaw Rico." Rico. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Me either. Kalo says, top five thrills too hard to have definitive rank, but give me number five, Bone Collector. Yeah, it's a good pick. Good one. Good pick. Yep. Chris said that was a good one. Uh, City says, number five is The History of Violence. Great movie. Thriller directed by David Cronenberg, Vigo Mortensen, Mario Bala, Ed Harris, William Hurt, RIP. Everyone has something to hide. 4.5 out of five. Yeah, I love the movie. I, I just, I watched it for the stream. It just felt more of like a drama to me. Crime drama. Then oh. uh, I'm thriller. Okay, so the killing of a sacred deer is on Plex, Pluto, and Tubi. Oh, yeah, I think it's it's probably still on Netflix too. It's yeah, a four out of five on Sacred Deer. Sydney says, "All right." Visiting hours is thriller um, with Michael Ironside and what I believe is his best role. Old Steven. Yep. My runner says bad bad JoJo. Hmm. Uh, Chris says domestic disturbance, double jeopardy, Pacific Hot, seven hot and saucy pizza girls. <laughs> <laughs> Dom- domestic disturbance is a really good one. That's, that's yeah. Un- yeah. well, yeah, I like that one. It's I fun. just <laughs> got a, a copy of Hot and Saucy Pizza Girls. I've had it in my drawer fucking forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Pacific Heights as well. Yeah, yep. solid list. Yeah, yep. Killer Secondary Twenty Four movie. Yep. yep. Hello says thrillers are what I watch most these days, and it's hard to be definitive with top five, but I can give you five favorites. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's what yeah. it is. Five favorite. It's not five best. It's not no. five whatever. It's your five favorite, whatever it is. Yeah, because yeah, truthfully, I mean, not, I'm not going to say this is a top five thriller of all times, but for me, um, it's, it's, it's going to be up there for me. It's definitely one that's going to make my top five. But most people, that's not going to be their top five for sure. As you said, hot spot, hot sauce, pizza girls is a forgotten gym. That's a full fledged porn, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Cal says, damn, Ant Man stole my next pick. Oh, sweet. <laughs> There's a curious he was getting the game of clones, Bruce Poitation Collection uh, Volume 1. That's a very, get the documentary instead. That's a very expensive set. Uh, from what I, I probably like twelve movies or something like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's not going to be cheap. Hmm. Yeah, Sydney said the Good Son, good movie, three out of five. Yeah. Uh, Presswell, what's going on? Hey, hey there. Oh, uh, am I the movie that my brother and my mom watched and seen it before I did? Okay. Proceeds is Blade Runner, a great sci fi thriller. Wake up, time to die. Yeah. Bunch of haze here. Who says Ted Bundy, the early years? Uh, he's talking about <laughs> uh, Good Son. Good Son, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So Chris C says Clute 71, Jane Fonda, Sutherland, and great thriller. I've heard that. I've heard good things about that. It's a criterion. What's going on, Russell? Russell. Hey, Russell. What's up, man? Say hey to everybody. Uh, Uzi said, I've been taking foreign films seriously since the beginning of the film. Good for you. Yep. Foreign film, it's, you know, it's a movie. It's film with training wheels to me. Uh, Uzi says, uh, Park Chan Wook. He also did Thirst, Handmade, and Three Extremes. Pretty popular director. In Korea, yeah, he did. He did old, uh, old boy. He old did old director. boy, yeah. Pretty popular in Korea. <laughs> Sydney says, "Old boy, the original remake, pretty good movies, three out of five. Yeah, you know that remake gets a lot of hate, but like I said, I think they there's some stuff in that remake that they did better, like the reveal at the end, and then the ending was a little bit better in the remake. But I still think the originals, uh, you know, better a step up from the remake, but." Uh, wow. I enjoy that remake's a lot of fun. It's ridiculous, but it's a lot of fun. 
Yeah, also, Lambs, in my opinion, is more thriller than horror, but um, are both overall. You know. Yeah. The Neon Academy. Demon is very thriller like and twist the sort of way. Yeah, the Academy <laughs> thought uh, Silence of Lambs was a thriller. Yeah. yeah, they don't want, they would never yeah. want to call that a horror movie. They're not going to call it a horror when it sweeps the Oscars. No. <laughs> Bastards. Uh, Chris's homeboy looks like <laughs> Prince Hole had this more error art. Yeah. They cut his hair right before they let him out, and he even explain. He even talks about. It. He's like, "I don't know why they cut my hair like this. I didn't come in like this." But th that's how they cut it when they let him out. Okay, this says shoot shoot kills on YouTube. Okay, cool. oh, good to know. Go. Probably looks like shit. I'm sure. Only having a DVD release. I'm sure it looks like. I'm sure it looks terrible on YouTube. It looks terrible on that DVD. <laughs> Uh, my brother, so how about Marathon Man 76 starring yeah, Dustin Hoffman? Absolutely. absolutely, that's a great conspiracy uh film, yeah. Man, uh, RIP uh, Louis Gossett Jr., man, he, he's got some great films I love, man. Them Iron, uh, Iron Eagle, Iron Eagle. Enemy, Enemy, Mind. Enemy, Mind. Enemy Mind, yeah, Digstown, yeah, Digstown, yeah. Oh, fuck, I forgot about Digstown, yeah, he's great. Okay. Digstown. The fights in uh, the woods. No, it's a good one. James Woods, man. That movie gets dark pretty quick there at one point, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's pretty dark turned. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> uh, Chris, so the General's Daughter is um is an interesting one. The Presidio with Sean Connery. Man, I haven't seen the Presidio in a long time. Yeah. General's Daughter. Cal says, Pop, those Jennifer Tilly movies in year five don't perpetrate. You got the you got the Tillys in there. Oh, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. No, there is no <laughs> Tillys in none of my five. <laughs> No. Uh, okay, so uh, give me a four fallen and, and split and can't choose. <laughs> Fallen's really, really underrated. Uh, really yeah, underrated. yeah, I like Fallen. Two more bangers right there, man. It's it one of my favorite Denzel flicks. Yep. Pacific Heights, great underrated one. Also, Desperate Measures, even more so. Mm. Yeah, Michael Keaton, he's great in Pacific Heights as the, yeah, the psycho. Is. Oh, yeah. I pre ordered the British Plantation 135 ship. 12 movies. I mean, that's depends on what movies are, but that's not too bad. Yeah. You know, take the Russell is going for that box set as well. He says German expressionism film is only popular in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, hey, hey, yeah. yeah, okay, but that's my favorite one. Man, me, and the, me and the wife rewatched that again the other night, man. It still holds up. I think he won an Academy Award for that role, too. Mayonnaise. <laughs> All right, we're going to mark it there. Nice. Moving on, guys. We gonna... I saw Caveman asked in the chat if this has an English dub. Yeah, it does. And it's a good English dub. So, uh, oh, did I miss it? It's somewhere in no. there. I remember seeing it. All right. Do you, do you prefer it with the subtitles or the dub? In English dub. The English uh, dub. It, it even has... The English dub subtitles, a separate subtitle track for the English dub, because I mean it's Korean, so the you know the the way they they word their sentences is written reverse usually or whatever, so they they put a separate subtitle track for the English dub. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. What you got for number four, Steve? All right, my number four is going to be uh, things to do in Denver when you're dead. Oh shit. Sure. I've never seen uh, that. This, mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, 1996, uh, an hour and 56 minutes. Uh, stat cast, man. Andy Garcia, Christopher Walken, Christopher Lloyd, William Forsyth, uh, Treat Williams, Steve Buscemi, uh, Jack Warden, and Feruza Bulk. Uh, it's directed by Gary Fleeter. Um, premise of the movie, um, uh, it's this guy, uh, Andy Garcia, he's the, uh, the star of the film. He's kind of like a douchebag, schmoozy, fucking slick back hair ex. I, I guess he's, he used to be like connected in like the Denver mob that doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so I mean that aspect of the movie. Like, you would say that. You would say it dumb. doesn't exist. You're involved. <laughs> but uh Just scalping tickets since the eighties over there. <laughs> well, if it does exist, it, it doesn't have a heavy presence in downtown Denver, I don't think. Um they're but, hanging uh, out at the artisanal the artisanal <laughs> brownie shop. <laughs> uh but uh anyway, uh he's kind of like uh he's trying to uh, find his way out. He's trying to uh start his own business. Um he's doing like um I don't know, people are recording videos uh uh when they're dying for their children or grandchildren or whatever and they they pass all that shit along or wh- whatnot. But the premise of the movie um Christopher Walken is kind of like the uh I don't know, the dawn of Denver apparently and he's paralyzed and he uh he calls uh Andy Garcia in to, to see him and tells him he needs to pull a favor uh his son is a pedophile and he's sick and he's sick in the head now apparently but uh he was engaged to a, a girl named Meg and uh when she broke things off with him like everything kind of went south and I, he he feels like that's where his son really kind of fucking lost his shit so his whole plan is he wants to scare the shit out of this uh new guy that she's seeing um so that uh she'll cut co- she'll come back to his son basically um and so uh Andy Garcia doesn't want to do it, but uh Christopher Walken apparently uh funded his business and tells him that he needs to do this for him. So he tells him he'll do it if he can build a crew. So he builds a crew, he's got Christopher Lloyd, um like an old like I don't know, I guess he used to be in the mob or whatever too, um, works with him. Treat Williams, he's kind of like a, a crazy fucker. Uh, there's a black dude in the group. I can't remember his name, um, but uh, he's in the group. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then now, uh, yeah, William Forsyth. He's a family man. He's got two kids, uh, but uh, he they try and uh, they stop this guy on his way coming back from the uh, Denver airport and uh, they pull him over Uh, things go south uh, as they often do in these mob situations and uh, unfortunately uh, after that uh, Christopher Walken's character puts a hit out on uh, Andy Garcia and all of his crew um i and he the hit that he's putting out on him is buckwheat and apparently that is like dying in the most terrific way possible and like one of the most popular ways of that is getting shot up the ass Um, (laughs) holy shit and uh so the guy that they send out is actually steve buscemi uh he's the hit man so steve buscemi is your heavy huh yeah, he, he's as fierce as they come, Brad. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe this is a Fargo prequel. <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. go wrong with Steve Buscemi, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's a, he's a lot more stoic in in this uh, yeah. in this role. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Like i i I've seen this movie a couple of times, but i I didn't really pay attention. I was always told that like most of this movie wasn't filmed in Denver. Like actually watching this a couple of nights ago, like almost everything in this movie is filmed in Denver, and uh, Treat Williams' apartment is actually the exterior anyway is the first uh, apartment building that I ever uh, lived in or rented on my own. Um. But uh, yeah, it, it's a good flick. Uh, no happy endings. Pretty much uh, everybody gets picked off one by one. And yeah, it, it's got a stack cast, a decent uh, plot, and it's we're checking out. It's kind of slept on. No one really ever talks about it. You don't hear it mentioned. 
Yeah, I'm not familiar with it at all. Yeah. I uh, in print, there, I got the same release you got there. Yeah, uh, in print just up. put this out. This is the first Blu-ray release, I believe. And yeah, like they only got one DVD release. Yeah. Well, no, you can't take my money, but you can take my money. Judgment Night. <clears throat> nice. Yep. Man, oh, man. I love this movie. <laughs> it's so good. It's all big. Yeah, I man, I just, you know, four friends living in Chicago decide to go to a boxing match, uh, but they get s- stuck in this crazy fucking backed up traffic, you know, and all this stuff. So they take a little detour. And they go right into the middle of nowhere, right in, like, the hood, fucking, you know, just absolutely desolate. <laughs> There's, like, nothing around, just a bunch of, like, homeless people. And, um, yeah, and they uh, they witness a murder, and uh, Dennis Leary and his uh, goons are basically out to uh, kill these guys because they, they saw them kill this other dude, so... You know, very simple. They're just on the run. But I love this cast. You got Emilio Estevez, Cuba Gooding Jr., um, Stephen Dorff, and Jeremy Piven. Those are the four guys that, you know, get lost. And then Dennis Leary, <clears throat> your main bad guy, and him and his three buddies are chasing after those guys, trying to kill them the entire time. So really stacked cast. Uh, Jeremy Piven is hilarious in this movie. I love his character. Um and I, Cuba Gooding Jr. is actually really great in this, too. I mean, I thought, you know, he plays, you know, kind of like the, the badass best friend to uh, Emilio Estevez. And uh, I really liked his character. But Dennis Leary is one of the stand. I mean, him as this villain is just because, he you know, he he blends the, the gangster with the comedy so well, you know, and it's, it's, it's just perfect. Um, but yeah, they're chasing them all over and it really looks like they're in like downtown Chicago. I know they filmed it in Ch- Chicago and LA, but it where where they're shooting at, I mean, it does, it's just a downtown area, you know, it's just an empty, like vacant downtown area. And one of the places that they filmed actually had a murder happen. <laughs> there actually was. <laughs> Um, a 16 year old kid executed another 16 year old kid as a part of some kind of ex, you know, uh, some kind of uh, initiation process. So they had to obviously the army, I guess, got sent out there and police and everybody, and they ended up having to leave. You know, they couldn't film there anymore, and they had to go to a whole different area to film. So pretty insane. Um, <laughs> but you can tell. I mean, they really. That's what I love about the film is it feels very gritty because they really are on the run and you get to see all the city and you know and just all these different like the buildings and the empty lots and it it just really feels like you're there um and even they even go through the sewer system at one point too which looks like a real sewer system i mean it's fucking nasty so i mean they did a great job the atmosphere the music man the soundtrack is insane for this great soundtrack and Alan Silvestri did the score, the same guy who did Predator and Predator 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and let me tell you something. The score to this sounds very similar to Predator. If you, I want, Pay attention to the score the next time you watch Judgment Night. It has a lot of those same uh, beats as you hear in uh, Predator, for sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I love this movie. Uh, you know, it's one that I go back and rewatch very often, probably once a year at least. Because, uh, like I said, it blends the the suspense, some comedy, some good action. Uh, there's like a scene in the hallway where the the thugs are all br- kicking down people's apartments and every you know their their apartment doors because they're trying to find they're trying to find these guys. And they got the song blasting, and you just see the camera go through. And the one guy's got a shotgun; he's blasting the door down. The other guy's kicking the door. It's just it's filmed so well. I love the way it's shot. Um, but yeah, that's. That's my number four, man. Judgment Night. Can't go wrong with that. Yeah, man. Great fucking movie. Yeah. I'm a goddamn college graduate. <laughs> the homeless <laughs> guy in the uh, the train car. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, my next one here, 2013's Blue Ruin. Uh, <sighs> ah. Yeah. Really solid um, modern crime thriller. Really more a thriller more than crime because the... I mean, for... To be a crime movie, you're going to have to have criminals, and there's not a criminal to be found in this movie. They're all like, 
it's like it's like white trash limo drivers versus a homeless man uh it's really not <laughs> like <laughs> it's not really a crime movie but it is a thriller uh written and directed by jeremy solner uh and uh macon blair macon blair's uncredited but this solner and blair are best friends macon blair is the lead in this uh he also they also did green room together um he's been on he's had a pretty good acting career so far uh you got Devin Rattray uh, as Ben is uh, Macon's friend in this that helps him out, who was Buzz from Home Alone. He came. This is his comeback movie. But basically, what you have here is you have this like feckless, like pussy boy, uh, Macon Blair. His parents get killed. They get murdered, and um, by the father of a there's there's an affair going on. And the other party murders the the father who was cheating on him with his, cheating on his wife together, and the wife gets killed in the fray. And um, one of his sons goes to prison for him because he's dying of cancer. So uh, Macon Blair, the son of the parents that were killed, just gives up on life and becomes a homeless man in um, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, very, very, you could just tell. It didn't have it going together. It didn't have it together before this happened. And then when it happened, he's just like, what do I fucking do now? He just gets in his car and drives to the beach and just just becomes a bum for however, however many years it is. I can't remember, 10 years, something like that. The guy, uh, the son who took the plea deal for the murder got out early. And uh, he decides that since he's out, he's going to go kill him. So he try he, even it's even an odyssey to get there. You know, he gets he gets he picks up cans to get a battery to put in the <laughs> shitty car that he has, and he's airing up the tires. He has to go get money to get a map so he can go find the place. And he's trying to get a gun. He breaks into a car that he thinks would have a gun. It has the stickers on it. He's the gun has a lock on it. <laughs> he's trying to break the fucking lock yeah. and break the gun. I mean, it it's not a comedy, but to me, it's funny. I don't know why I think it's so funny, but it is. So he ends up settling on like a fillet knife to try and kill the guy with it. He hides in the bathroom and waits okay. for him. His his white trash family picks him up from the fucking prison in a, a limo. Yeah, fucking limo. Through, yeah, he goes straight to the bar. He waits for him in the bathroom and he sticks a fucking um, a fillet knife, a shitty like Walmart fillet knife, right in the side of his head and breaks it off it's just like he's doing it he's doing it and you're like you're terrified for him at this point you're like he's gonna get killed he's gonna go in here and get killed by this fucking guy that's gonna happen and they're gonna these hillbillies are gonna stomp him out but he somehow makes it work he tries to slash the limo his tire on his way out so that they can't pursue him cuts the shit out of himself he's just a bloody mess he's a vagrant again and you know he's on his run on the run and they try to do the same to him Instead of calling the police, they try to track him down and kill him. And they're a bunch of, you know, they're WT fucking yokels. Y- yokels, basically. They're they're and they try to run him down. And it's just it's just an odyssey of people fucking up. And uh it's a lot of fun. And um, you know, the Buzz character, uh Devin Rattray, who's like this gun show freak, uh tries to help him along the way and you know, of course, the, the homeless guy has never shot a gun in his life, so he tries to put them on. Like, they, he tries all types of different weapons with them, and I don't know. It's just, uh, it's gory. It's violent. It's strange. Uh, like I said, imagine Ned Flanders trying to commit a revenge murder. You know, that <laughs> level of uselessness, and he's going up against these hillbillies that are really stupid, and they can't figure out. Like, at one point, he goes to their house and tries to wait for him to kill him. He falls asleep. <laughs> in their house and and they they've been gone this whole time running the streets trying to find them they're, they're chasing after him in a fucking old shitty limo i don't know just something about it i really enjoyed it and it's a really you know if you you watch the bonus features it was really a labor of love for these guys and the guy who directed this he kind of puts you in mind of like cory uh, wilkie's movies and more just a very soft-spoken guy and he's like i love revenge thrillers but i'm just not a you know, I don't know that I have the grit to make the kind of movie that I want. And he's like, so I'm not going to make a movie about a tough guy. I'm going to make a movie about somebody like me trying to commit, commit a revenge murder. And it works really well. Cause like I said, he's, he's pretty helpless. There's a point in the movie, probably my favorite part where he gets shot with an arrow 
The hillbillies have a crossbow. <laughs> he gets shot in the leg with the arrow, and he tries to, like, he thinks he's going to be badass and go Harvey R. Berdem and take the fucking arrow out himself. <laughs> and it, he's, like, trying to saw it off, and he's trying to pull it out, and he's about to pass out. And then the next scene, it's <laughs> him in the emergency room walking in going, I had an accident with my leg. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, just give it a shot. Uh, check it out. Uh, I don't, this was a, this is an anchor Bay release. It can't be much. Uh, it's it's out of print much. now. It oh, is, of course. It is that much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun movie, man. I don't know if fun is the right word, but. You can get yeah, like go a ahead. foreign yeah. release. Okay, so maybe there is a good release of it out there, but yeah, hey, check it out. Yeah, that was a recommendation you gave me. I really enjoyed that one. Um, it was <laughs> yeah. a good time. Great fucking yeah. movie. Uh, Making Blair is directing the uh, Toxic Avenger remake. Oh, that'll be cool. He's great yeah. in The Hunt. He's been on a lot of stuff. He's yeah. really good in The Green Room. He's great in Green He's Room, awesome. yeah. All right, my number four is um, Breakdown. Nice. Kurt Russell. Oh, Man, um, such a fucking great movie. Um, I rewatched this uh, two nights ago, and uh, I had seen it in probably a couple of years. Um, man, it's um, it was a blast, man. Um, Kurt Russell, J.T. Walsh. This was the last movie J.T. Walsh did before he passed away, which I didn't realize that. But um, yeah, J.T. Walsh. But I tell you what, the, what makes this movie so fucking good is J.T. Walsh is a really, really creepy, good fucking bad guy. Um, the premise of this movie is you have Kurt Russell and his wife are moving. They're driving across this desert, Arizona desert, whatever it is, and they run into some run into some trouble. They basically, you know, get the attention of this um this local hillbilly gang, or or it's really just like three or four guys that go out and fucking I guess just like terrorize people, kidnap people. They're like human and, trafficking people or something. What are they yeah. doing with those people? I don't remember. They never what it says. You, you find out this guy's got a hole in his fucking barn. Yeah, you know, he's got a big ass, a big ass barn, or whatever. That he, he fucking throws people in, like women in or whatever. Um, but like I said, the um, this movie is fucking high tension. You know, Kurt Russell is like, what the fuck just happened? You know, there's one scene where um, basically what happens is Kurt Russell's car- truck breaks down, and um, he has this guy at the gas station right before it breaks down. Whatever the guy's the actor's name, um, uh, I got it written down is MC Ganey. Now, you may know MC Ganey from Con Air. MC Ganey is the guy flying the plane in Con Air. Big burly guy with a beard, you know, real like yeah. laugh. Oh, yeah. Swamp thing or whatever they called him in yeah, Con Air. Thing. Yeah. Um, well, he plays kind of like um, JT Walsh's right hand man. You know, he's one of the four fucking boy wonders of this little fucking group of fucking bad guys in this movie. <laughs> and um, so basically, he, he runs into fucking Kurt Russell at the gas station. They had like an altercation on the road earlier. They meet up at the gas station. This guy's trying to, to start shit with, with um, Kurt Russell. And Kurt Russell is just a you know regular, you know, um, just a regular calm guy. He, he's not looking for any kind of trouble. And this guy's just giving Kurt Russell shit. And um, a little bit later, Kurt Russell and his wife down the road. The car breaks down. J.T. Walsh pulls up in the fucking semi-truck, whatever, you know, and offers to give him a ride. Um, ends up, for whatever reason, stupid part of the movie, Kurt Russell lets his wife get in the fucking semi-truck with a stranger. And so, yeah, you go down to the fucking down the road and call somebody, call a tow truck. I'll stay here with the car, you know, and who would, who would their right mind would fucking let their wife get in the car with some trucker guy. Right. Exactly. Well, right, she, she is one fucking missing. Do what? I said, but is he trying to get rid of her? I don't know. You know, you know, who knows? Um, he fuck a little bit later. He runs into the, runs into JT Walsh again, fucking runs him down. JT Walsh looks at him. This is where JT Walsh is fucking the creepy levels on fucking 10. He's like, what are you talking about? I've never seen you a day in my fucking life. And he's like, like, he's never seen Kurt Russell in his life. And Kurt Russell's like, what the fuck are you talking about? This was a half hour ago. And by this time, a fucking um, a sheriff pulls up. And he's, Kurt Russell's trying to convince the sheriff this guy just kidnapped his wife. This guy's like very convincingly going, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. And it, just, it goes on from there. The tension just keeps building and keeps building. And by the time it gets to the end or whatever, and you, you see just how fucking crazy J.T. Walsh really is, um, it, it, the ending is very sad, very sad, very satisfying. The whole fucking movie is a fucking 10 on the fucking ten, tension level. And, um, this is probably, I ain't gonna say it's my favorite movie that Kurt Russell's ever done. Cause he, he acts his ass off in this. You can, you, you yeah, believe it, especially movie. the very last shot. I ain't gonna say how it ends, whatever, but after the final shit happens, you see Kurt Russell on the, on the bridge with his wife. Well, there's a spoiler with his wife, whatever. And basically Kurt Russell looks like he just been through hell. 
<laughs> I mean, just some of the best. He looks beat down to death. He just went, he just went through. Um, and by the way, his wife, whatever, is Kathleen Quinlan, whatever. She was the teacher in, um, in Twilight Zone, the one that back then was the, spo the spoiled brat kid with all the powers. Um, mm -hmm. Twilight Zone, the movie. I never liked her that much, but she's okay. She just, <laughs> there ain't much to her, but she plays the wife. Um, now, one thing about this movie is Kurt Russell. I didn't write this down. I, just, I was just reading about it. Kurt Russell, and I, I do like Kurt Russell, but he had to get a plane. He had a contract. I guess he would work so many hours. And then a helicopter or plane would have to take him from the set, fly him home, and he'd have to be home for like so long. And while the whole fucking production had to shut down, so he could oh, go home and rest after so many hours of working. And I thought that was a little, you know, a little pussified. But yeah, be a um, little, a little bit of a bitch. There must not have been. It's that movie. If you watch it, it's like I don't. There must not have been lodging near or something like that. I guess. I guess. It probably didn't the 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 looked like fucking um. What's the town in fucking Tremors? It looks like yeah. a little fucking Tremors town, just the middle of fucking nowhere of like five buildings, two cops, mm -hmm. you know. Um, he had a hard time getting anybody to even believe him that he was there with his wife or, you know, did she run off? Did you have a fight? Is she real? Is yeah. there really even a wife? It's like nobody will even believe or listen to him. And that's the scene the, where he, he has to go into a bank whatever, to draw money out is all I'm going to say. And that scene where he's sitting there at the table, you, that's a, that, Kurt Russell just acts his ass off in this movie. And you feel his fucking tension. Um, he actually said, uh, Kurt Russell says that this was the most exhausting film he's ever made, um, saying the character was in a constant state of anxiety. And I mean, the, the people watching the movies is anxiety filled also. And the movie is just from start to finish, an anxiety fucking ride is what it is. Um, if you got a wife, and this is something that, first off, my wife ain't getting in the fucking semi truck with some motherfucker. <laughs> Why well, just sit in the car and chill? You know? I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Either we're both going or I'm going. Yeah. One of the two. But, I think um, his argument was they just bought a brand new Cherokee and it was, you know, they didn't want to leave the car and, or whatever. Yeah. Like, I'm like, who cares? It's fucking broke down. Who's going to steal it? It can't run, you know, yeah. just leave the stupid yeah. car. So, um, yeah, like I said, it's a great one, man. And, um, there was another Kurt Russell movie. I'm not going to say which one it was. And I thought that was going to make my list and this replaced that one. Um, it's a much better movie than the other one. I don't want to mention it in case somebody brings it up, but, um, but yeah, this is um this this is a good one, man. Um, it holds up. Well, this came out in 1997. 97, not, 90s had some great thrillers, man. Oh, they really nice. good. Yeah, so it was my my favorite decade for thrillers. When I said that to Brad, and Brad's message back to me was they had some good fuck thrillers. <laughs> I think <laughs> it was known for the sex thriller, <laughs> the 90s. All right, let's see where we left off at here. Uh, Ken Carlson says the eighth disc it, and said is exclusive to the web store. Um, has the super rare Big Boss 2. Can't wait to see oh, that cool. one for the uh Bruce that, Leroy. That or whatever. It's not Bruce, yeah. Bruce Leroy, it's the Bruce Exploitation set, bro. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hagan said just got done watching The Omen. Um, got it. I'm going to check out the new Omen film next week. That's coming out um, called The First Omen. First Omen. Yeah. I heard Yeah, I heard it was okay. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I need to go back and rewatch all the Omens, get ready for that, I guess. I ain't seen them in a while. Is this like a reboot or a, like a I, sequel? I think I'm or talking to Benicio about it. He heard really good things about it. So I don't remember if he said it was a reboot or what it was. Yeah, it kind of looks like it might even be like a prequel just because of the time period it's set in. Maybe. Not sure, though. Yeah. yeah Russell said, looking forward to seeing um, everything, especially the documentary. Talking about this up. I wonder if that yeah. documentary is sold separately. Also, yeah, things in Denver, I saw the trailer a few months back. It looks real good. Nick Katana 65, where is Andy Garcia today? It's a good point. Yeah. Last I've seen him I was seen in, him in ocean movies. Ocean I just seen him in something movie. recently, like maybe uh, a few years, few years back. Okay, says uh, Lou Gossett Jr. was the first African American to ever win the Oscar for a supporting role in *Officer and the Gentleman*. Yep. Uh, Andy Garcia was the villain in the *The Affordables 4. Oh yeah. man! <laughs> God, <laughs> I haven't heard of *The Affordables*, much less fucking all four of them. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, my number four movie is Blue Ruin. <laughs> he says thank you, hey. by the way, Brad. Just a moment. There you go. Um, my number four movie is Blue Ruin, directed by Jeremy's. Everything Brad just says. <laughs> it's such a good movie. 
uh, Christmas Search in 2018. That's that, that one there is one that I wanted to rewatch for this. I didn't get around to watching it. Oh, uh, Search is great, man. It's it is. All remember being a good one. Yeah. Okay, Kyle else says Christopher Walken, my boss. Um, so a prequel to Suicide Kings. Mm, so yeah. yeah. Let's see. Trini says nice pick. Uh, Sydney says things are doing Denver great movie four out of five. And Sydney's either of these movies are really good or Sydney's loosening the belt. It's thrillers. It's yeah, thrillers. Yeah, there you go. You're it's, right. It's, you're it's right. It's you're it's right. Genre. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Well, things doing different when you're dead is on Pluto and Paramount. Okay, we and pimping the streaming. Everybody quit, quit clicking physical media. Everybody go stream. Yeah, stream it first. Stream it first. Yeah. We spend the money on it. Absolutely, yeah, I'm a big that's really that shit now. That's, I've saved a lot of money doing that. That imprint release is fucking thirty dollars. Yeah, you know, for uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. No. What's going it's on, Tiana? Hey, appreciate you being here. Alice saying hello. Much of hello to Tiana there. And Tiana says, "I love a, love a good thriller movie." Yeah. Me too, yeah. man. It, it was it was um a lot of fun getting ready for the stream. Gave me a reason to go back and watch a lot of good ones. And, um, Uzi said, "Good soundtrack on Judgment Night with a metal rap crossover." Right, exactly. Yeah, that was like one of the first ones. It's like a perfect blend. No, I think like uh, that second Crow movie did one right after that. Mm. Judgment Night, great movie, three and a half out of five. Yeah, you know, Chris said the soundtrack is the best part. Biohazard and Onyx. I guess that's, that's the yeah, that's one of the bands. Yep. Hey man, says Blue Ruins on YouTube, Plex, and Tubi. Yeah, definitely check it out. If you if it's out of print, it's going to cost some money. Definitely stream it first. Yep. I think that might even be on Netflix. The first time I seen that was on Netflix. Yeah, I don't know. Chris so here's one that one talks about Fatal Beauty with Whoopi Goldberg and Brad Dorf. Yeah, I've wow. never heard of that. That's an interesting yeah, beauty. I think I have seen that. Yeah, Kyle says Pippin's death seems uh, satisfied sad as fuck. Where I was like, damn. Yeah, that, that thing gets me every time too, man. Because you, I don't want to ruin it, but you think he's gonna be okay? You think yeah. he is? Maybe he is talking some shit. And yeah, yeah, man. That's a tough thing. What about Jeremy Piven's hairline in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> he goes from that to like entourage, like a full head of hair. Yeah. He's I love it when he's. I love it when the RV gets all fucked up and destroyed, and he's just like, "Now I own this." Piece oh of shit. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Here, he's just loaning it out, but he's just basically borrowing it. You know, he didn't want to fucking buy the damn thing, but. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. No one talks about Whoopi no more. That's true. Yeah. Well, you hear a lot of that talk, yeah. Like a ghost, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. no. I was like, "Damn, the army was there." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, that's what I was reading. I mean, you know, if it's true or not, but yeah. They're sitting there, Brad. Says, Damn, Brad, thanks a lot. But right before you pulled that pick, I seen him put it in the chat, and I seen you throw yours up. I'm sure Sydney was like, "Fuck." Yeah, I, uh -huh. it's a, it's not your typical thriller. I think it's it's a lot of fun. And it's that first time project for those guys. The first movie they ever made. It's yeah. a pretty good first try. Yeah, that's not a bad one. Uh Callis says he took them he took them left leftover predator soundtracks and gave it to them. Elf did for Dick Tracy and Dartman. Absolutely, yeah. man. You you can def in Darkman, you can absolutely yeah. hear like, the Batman theme and stuff in there, which right. which works well for the movie. I mean, it makes sense, but yeah. in uh, Judgment Night, you can hear that Predator theme, you know, in the score for for sure. You can hear it. <laughs> well, Rango says, "Limited Driver versus Homeless" sounds great. Yeah, I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> Russell says, "Jam Brady with a shotgun is worth the price of admission." There you go. Yeah, Jan Brady is in it. Uh, she uh, plays one of the white trash limo owning uh, family members. They own a, like a limo from like the late nineties, and they you know that's <laughs> their like that's their business taking kids to the prom and stuff. I don't know. It's Bro. really trashy. Chris says, "One I just watched out of the furnace with Christian Bale and Woody Harrelson, good gritty crime thriller." Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. that one too. Yeah, yeah. solid. Uh, Kyle says, Blue Ruin Brad just sold us a comedy. <laughs> yeah, uh, you may not think it's funny, but I, I definitely did think it was funny. Nah, it's definitely comical. 
Walrus, I know. No, well, you diddly diddly yeah, did I'm laugh. Y'all right. can read a bunch of those. Uh, <laughs> City says breakdown, very good movie, three and a half out of five. Because yeah. if, if you like breakdown, there's a newer Gerard Butler one um, called Last Seen Alive, cool thriller flick. Yeah, I saw yeah. that on Netflix. I think it's been sitting on Netflix for for a while. Okay. I'll check that out then. Yeah. Law Biting Citizen, that's a good Ger Gerard Butler thriller. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Okay, and I said breakdowns on Paramount and MGM. Um, Brent said, I saw a 4K announcement today for breakdown. They did. They I have no problem with that. That gives me a reason to get rid of another imprint title. This is Dream yeah. Factory. Well, or <laughs> shout to like 4K, probably. Something like that. Probably. probably. Uh, Callis says, uh, Anne stole my pick. A good son who gave me a give me a three, uh, five, or give me a give me a three fight club. Fight club, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. that's pretty big, yeah. Uh, Wild Reynolds is Bass Samaritan 2018, starring David Tennant, uh, David Tennant thriller. Yeah. Ain't gonna buy a comma. Uh, says, I got a feeling Brad would say, uh, would take the wife, leave the car, <laughs> be all on the day, today show, just like fuck it. Depends. I'll say, hey, Texas, uh, affordables is what I call expendables for. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. We got it. I didn't, but I did. I kind of feel like that's what Expendables <laughs> 3 was the same way, too, man. Expendables 3. Uh, all right. Let's move on to our, our number three here. Steve, what you got, man? All right. It's going to be Citizen X. Hmm, not for uh, that one either. Is that the no, snapper no. case right there? You got the snapper There's like case. a... 2000 hbo like original movie i think um i think you can actually see this i've seen it streaming on hbo max or max or whatever um but they there's no blu-ray release of it. it it's only gotten this little snap case fucking release here um donald sutherland um stephen ray um Let's see, he was in, I don't know, uh, Company of Wolves. Uh, he was like the the werewolf dude in that. He was in The Crying Game. Um, let's see, Jeffrey DeMunn. He's in like every Frank Darabont joint. Um, Max von Zedow. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, great cast, uh, set decoration. Um, it, it takes place in, uh, Rostov, Russia, um, 1982, uh, and this movie's through 1990, and it's basically about, uh, serial killer, uh, Andre Chikatilo. He's, like, the first documented serial killer in Russia. Um, he's played by Jeffrey DeMunn in this movie. Um, you're introduced to him like really early in the movie. First scene of the movie, you see basically um, uh, a coroner played by Stephen Ray um, just about ready to clock out for the night. And they, they roll in a, a, a child's body. And uh, he tells them to go back out. Uh, the, the guys that brought in the body, he tells them to go back out, search the area and see if there are any clues um and the guy's like pissed off because it's it's the sun's going down it's he's getting ready to go home himself but uh he goes out with a couple of guys and uh they turn up a bunch more bodies uh they just keep rolling them in rolling them in and uh yeah this dude was pretty fucking evil uh but uh yeah, it, this movie really reads more like a drama than a thriller, so I almost took it off the list. But just the uh, the performances alone, like it's pretty heavy content, but it's handled so well in this. It's everything except for the violence. Like the the only thing I really have to take uh, points away for there are two really terrible like killing scenes in this movie, like. Uh, Jeffrey D. Munn's just stabbing someone like this and they're just like <laughs> laying there and there's another one where he's stabbing someone like in the stomach 
like repeatedly and they're just letting that like letting him stab the shit out of them <laughs> um so those two parts are fucking god awful but outside of that um yeah you, you really feel the weight uh steven ray's character uh rostov russia at first wanted to deny that they even had a serial killer um and these bodies just keep piling up over years and the uh it's based on a book called the uh killer department uh yeah or the killer department and it was basically stephen ray's character was the killer department so he through like eight years hunting this dude down by himself like in russia with no help from the government whatsoever they pretty much did whatever they could to like uh step over him and kind of like gaslight everything that he did to slow him down um and uh at one point you you see uh donald sutherland's character he's kind of like up higher like a colonel um for the the rust off uh, uh communist committee or whatever but uh he sits Stephen ray down and like commends him and like i don't know the the bromance and camaraderie like between those two characters like in that scene alone like it's on par with anything that darabont did in fucking the green mile or shawshank it's really fucking good um but yeah it's i i haven't watched it much like I've only seen it a few times and I haven't seen it in a long time, probably because the, uh, the content is pretty fucking heavy and it's pretty dramatic, but yeah, it's a good film. It should definitely get a, uh, a Blu-ray release at some point. I'll check it out. Man. I've never seen it. Awesome. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, yeah. it's not very graphic. Everything is handled, um, pretty tastefully. Um, and yeah, all the performances are really good. Like Damon, uh, as uh, Andre Chikatilo, like I always thought that dude resembled Jeffrey Demon, but I didn't know that was him until like I don't know. I I looked it up the last time I watched it, I think, and it kind of clicked. But like, yeah, that dude's like completely like a different kind of character in that movie. But yeah, we're checking out. Give it a shot. Made a note of it. All right. Next up, we got The Jackal. Oh, that's a good pick. Man, I love this movie. <laughs> it's so damn good. Because um, uh, you get to see Bruce Willis play a villain, which is awesome. You know, he's uh, a hired assassin who just goes around, you know, killing whoever he's hired to kill. And he, he's a chameleon. You know, he wears a bunch of different disguises. And he gets into, like, characters. At one yeah. point, he pretends to be like a gay guy you know and, i don't know is he pretending to be gay because <laughs> right well he yeah, seems gotta... pretty good at being gay and then yeah. when he's alone he acts pretty gay like he's yeah, in the he's like, a fancy hotel room in a bathrobe drinking champagne that's what I was... and taking a bath <laughs> yeah. you know by himself uh... was... yeah he's literally like sitting right <laughs> but maybe he is getting into character i don't know that... he's, he's the disguises, like you said, I don't mean to cut you off, but you said the disguises and then the characters, because it's beyond just a disguise. It's like a whole fucking ordeal. Like he has a whole backstory and everything yeah, prepared for it. So yeah, I like yeah. I like that a lot. No, that's what I would love, and I, that's what I was gonna mention too, right? Like the hotel scene where he's sitting there, and you can tell if he's sitting there in his bathrobe. He's like, I think he's smoking a cigarette. He's just really chill and mellow. And it, it does. It feels like he's sinking into the role. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, this is who I am for this next person. Because he's constantly switching faces, different hairstyles, mustache, no mustache. He even wears like a fat suit at one point, too. Yeah. And all he's doing all these different things. And Man, I mean, I just, it's so good. You get the scene with um, Jack Black where he's testing out <laughs> the sights, yeah. you know, on this giant <laughs> rifle that's controlled by... Artillery gun or whatever the hell it was. Like artillery, right, that's controlled by, you know, a computer, and he can just, you know, play, you know, he can basically set it up so he does, 
he can just be close by, but he doesn't even have to be there when he's shooting it, which you know is perfect because it's all controlled by a little computer. And he's in Jack Black, he's just using his like target practice in, in that scene <laughs> because Jack Black's like, No, man, no, I checked the I checked the sights a million times, it's perfect, it's spot on. No, no, and he's like, Okay, go over there and hold that thing up, you know, and I'll shoot it out of your hand. And he just blows off Jack Black's arm, <laughs> and it's just like blood everywhere. <laughs> And he's like, he's like, wait, before you lose consciousness, pick up that and whatever, <laughs> or something. Like, he's really just fucking with him the entire it's time. It's funny though, when he blows his arm off, and he's standing yeah. there, Jack Black's arm is spraying blood. He goes, "I told you it was off." Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This like blood, just ice cold. Yes, and it's it's a great role for Bruce Willis because usually we're so used to seeing him play the hero and everything, Die Hard, and. Just all you know, even the Unbreakable trilogy, and even this other movie that it comes with, Mercury Rising. I mean, he's always that same like guy, the hero, and it's it's so refreshing seeing him as a villain. And then you got Richard Gere, who's uh, in prison. He's an IRA like agent, you know, uh, who got uh, thrown into you know into prison. So they're they Sidney Poit, uh, Poitier comes in and says, you know, he's the head of the FBI or he's high up there on the FBI. And he says, you know, we'll we'll release you temporarily because you know what the you know who the jackal is. Well, you know what he looks like. So we'll release you on a temporary basis. And maybe we can work out something to get you freed or sent back to Ireland or whatever. Um, so, you know, he's working for the FBI and he's you know just trying he knows enough about the jackal to try and track him down and all this stuff and man the scene <laughs> i mean i don't want to spoil too but there's a scene man where he where he's hiding and then he plays that music that loud rock yeah. music and then he just like starts shooting at the fbi agents you know he's like tucked away and he blows the one dude away from the staircase it's like tuck, tucked under the staircase and he shoots up at him and I mean, there's just there's so many scenes like that that are just memorable, like the Jack Black one, him hiding, all the disguises, and like how he gets into character. It's worth it just for all the Bruce Willis stuff. Um, so yeah, that is uh, my number three pick, the Jackal. Yeah, go check that out. Pick, I've never seen that. I have to check it out. Oh yeah, you got to check that out. I'm not. I've never seen it either. Really uh, underrated. I don't know how people uh, why it's so underrated, but. It, some some people haven't seen it, and he is like, if you like Hitman movies, I mean, it's pretty. He would have to be a top five all time Hitman on yeah. on screen. That that character is so, uh, you know, once it starts, he can't stop. He's not going to stop until the target's dead or he's dead, and it's that kind of thing. Like he's the guy, the last guy you want to hire because there's no calling him off, kind of thing. And the disguises, you're like half of the damn. The fun of it is the disguises that he's yeah. he's kind of like he looks like Steven Seagal at one point, you know, like <laughs> it, it, it's very it's very strange, but it all works with the character that he's playing. Oh, and he also yeah. has uh, different accents too. He'll put on yeah. like an accent, like he had the Canadian accents or Minnesota type accent, whatever, you know, like oh gee, you know, you got you yeah. know, like that type of accent when he's the heavier set guy and he's got like the curly hair and the mustache and the glasses. So good. Well, I, like he he cruises this gay guy to get like yep. a hideout, and then like the gay guy comes home and he's just there and he's looking totally not gay. He looks totally different now. And the gay guy walks in and he's just like starts to question him a little bit. He goes, "Okay, that's enough of this." And just shoots the shit out of him. I yeah. love that scene. That was just hilarious the way that worked. That'll teach you to pick up strange men at a gay bar in Baltimore or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> <laughs> you ever read that one now too, Anthony? I'll check it out, man. I've never seen it. Cool. Let me know what you think. Yeah, we'll do. All right. Well, uh, I hope this isn't on Anthony's list, but it, it might be. But uh, my Number three is Identity. Uh, mm. This movie in this double pack. Both these are good. Great movie, you know. um, great movie. Yeah, 2003, directed by James Mangold. He did Logan. I believe he did Logan. Uh, yeah. It takes place in a remote Nevada uh, motel, but it's shot all on a studio back lot. That's a set. Can't tell it's a set, but it's a you know big production. John Cusack, Ray Liotta, uh, Pruitt Taylor Prince. That's the uh, fat guy with the eye twitching thing, you know, uh, 
You know, mm-hmm. he's got that yeah, that weird eye that does that thing. Devil's Played candy. Played killer in about a million movies. Yeah, Devil's Candy. Um, but basically, what it is is all these people are stranded in this motel during this massive rainstorm. There's big flood in you know rural Nevada. They're all traveling different areas and they all get stranded here, and they start to die off. They start to be you know killed off in random ways. And everybody has a room key found with it, but it's not a room key that they were staying in. It's like, you know, it starts, I think, at 10. And then the next mm-hmm. body, they find room key number nine. And they have to, they start to figure out that they have some similarities and commonality. They all have the sh- same birthday, things like that. And it kind of unravels into a mystery. And, I, you know, I don't even know if I should go into spoilers with it, but. Basically, it involves, you know, John Cusack's character is kind of the narrator, and you're trying to figure out what the hell. It's very intense. It's heavy on the mystery angle. I guess I won't spoil it, but uh, really, really strong uh, movie. It's surprised we don't have a better release of it, you know, a Stream Factory yeah. or something, but uh, this is a Mill Creek. It doesn't even have subtitles. Uh, both these are good. Um, Identity, like I said, uh, I, I don't really don't want to go any further and spoil it, but because... It's a heavy. It's if you if you know what it's about, even it, that's a spoiler. But they're basically right. there and they're getting knocked off one of the one of the time. Um, uh, what's that guy? Hawks. I can't remember his name. He was in Deadwood. He play, it plays the uh, motel owner. And my nope. favorite scene is involving wow. him. He's supposed to be watching this con that <laughs> that that that, that uh, Ray Liotta was transporting. Yeah, and they, they <laughs> John Cusack comes back and finds the con with the baseball bat shoved down his throat. And it's the right. hotel owner's down baseball his bat. Throat. It's literally down right. his throat. And like his head is like <laughs> facing up. That's a pretty cool shot. It's pretty a really cool shot. shot. Ray Liotta yeah. comes in, grabs him, and says, come here. What the fuck <laughs> is that? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, "My that's my con with your baseball bat stuck down his fucking throat. <laughs> it's a really good Ray Liotta roll. And yeah. uh, John Cusack's like, come on, man. I can't help you out with this. <clears throat> this it's, you had to kill this guy. And he's like, I swear I didn't do it. And you, you're, you're trying to – somebody there is the killer. That's the the part of it. And they try to figure it out. But it's a lot of fun. Pouring rain the whole time. Uh, really a good-looking set. I mean, you couldn't even tell it was a set, in my opinion. I, I really liked it. Yeah. And uh, really holds up well. I just rewatched watched I will say that the best way to watch that movie is – absolutely as blind as possible. Don't even watch the fucking trailer. Yeah. Um, my yeah. son had watched yeah. that movie and he basically set me down oh. one day, but I, I never heard of it before. This has been many years ago. And um, he said, but that's pops. we got to watch this movie. And I put it in and I, I didn't see a trailer. I knew nothing about it. And I have to say that the, the twist got me pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's done really fucking well. So I, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Excellent pick. Yeah. yeah give it a shot. All right. So, um, I'm going to talk about a movie, and I'm going to talk about some other shit, too, on this one. I'll just show you the movie. You probably know what I'm going to say. Um, it's going to be The Vanishing. Oh, the yeah. The American oh. version. The better yeah, one. Goodness. The better version. Oh, well, um, that, that can't be true. Well, let's just say this. Before I even give my thoughts on the movie, I have both. And I watched yeah. both um, to get ready for this because I want to talk about it. I've seen the, the, the original before, and I do like the original. But I'm going to say I'm a strong um, supporter of the American version. I think this is theaters when it first come out. I watched this one last year when I got the Criterion. Um, it's basically the same director. It's pretty much the same exact story except for the ending. Now, if you've never seen The Vanishing, go ahead and just jump out of the chat and come back because I'm fixing to pull the shit out of it. Um, so basically, the only difference between these two movies is the ending. This one here has got a fucked up ending. This one has got a happier ending. And this director was basically um, told that he could he could direct the American version of this with real actors. I'm like, well, be nice. Better <laughs> America, clip that America, <laughs> America. <laughs> and um, I don't want to piss off too, too many people, but I've watched both back to back, and you can't tell me after watching this that these actors are better than fucking um, Sandra Bullock, Kiefer Sutherland. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's 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 not day. It's not day. And basically, this this one here has got a happier ending. This one here, basically, the the killer gets away with it. Yeah, and I just prefer the blue. Other than that, the storyline is almost exactly the fucking same. You got the same director. He's got ten times the money on the American version. You know, um, it, 
I don't know. I, I watch them back to back. And I can't see how people can say the original so much better. I don't know. I feel like that if Criterion would have put this one out, uh-huh. and people would have been sitting around in their fucking silky bathrobes drinking Earl Grey tea, uh-huh. watching this one, raving about how fucking great it is. Yep. Um, Bingo. I don't know, man. I don't get it. I know I'm not cultured. I'm just a big <laughs> fucking white guy on here. But I watch them back to back, and I don't know if it's because I'm not French or Netherlands or wherever this motherfucker was made up. The comedy don't work. Not that there's a lot of comedy in it, but the little jokes they make, you know, like there's one scene in the fucking car. They're saying something. I'm reading the subtitles. She bites an orange while she's going to eat like an apple. The guy laughs, and it's like, it just, there's nothing about it that I just didn't care. This one here, you actually care about the characters, whatever. At least I did anyway. I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for it. I don't give a fuck. Hey, I, I like them both. Back. Hey, I watch them back to back. And is- you got you got to put that pinky all That's the, point. the way. The point out. I'm trying to make is that if Criterion <laughs> would have put this one out, yeah, everybody would be fucking raving about how fucking great it is. Oh my god, it's the same mm. fucking movie, the same fucking director, <laughs> yeah. and people shit on this one all the time compared to this one right here. I, I don't. Yeah, get they it. really do. It's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with funny games. You know, people. Yeah, yeah. I, I right. really like it's the movie. same fucking movie. It's the same movie, but it's bigger, bigger budget, better actors. You know, a, a better production. You know, of course, it's the same. If it's a shot for shot movie, then you know, you it, the one with more money is going to look better, just generally. You know. Yeah. And you have real actors this time. I don't know. It's just uh, <laughs> I hate that argument. <laughs> There's that. Well, there's in that funny wording. games, I don't believe those are real actors. I mean, I believe they they're acting, but they don't have a yeah. pedigree. You know, that maybe there was their first movie or whatever. Tim Roth and Naomi Watts. They've done tons of movies. They're real. Real actors, yeah, yeah they're, they're not grandfathered in, yeah. Well, the base purpose of the movie, like I said, if you've seen one, you've seen both. Um, um, Kiefer Sutherland and Sandra Bullock, they're having they're going some weird, stupid fucking vacation where they're going to look at <laughs> dead trees, you know, dead, dead places or whatever. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but um, they have a little scuffle, run out of gas. Um, they end up going to a gas station, they make up. She goes, she goes missing. She goes to the store to get a couple beers, never shows up again. She's gone. It fast forwards three years later, he's lost everything. He's dedicated his life, whatever, trying to find her. He, he gets another girl, whatever. Um, Nancy Travis, which got a lot of gravy on her taters, by the way, I always thought, but ends up with Nancy Travis, whatever. And, you know, she's trying to get him to kind of move on. He's addicted, whatever. He keeps on trying to find out what's going on with it. Many years later, whatever, basically, um, or I got, well, I guess, I mean, I guess maybe it's, it doesn't really say, maybe four, we'll say a little after three years later, Jeff Bridges finally reaches out to him and says, Hey, I'm the guy you're looking for, you know, and Jeff Bridges fucking kills it. Dude. He plays Barney. He plays this creepy fucking guy, the way he talks, you know, what makes it so fucking creepy for me is he's a regular Joe. He's a family man. You know, he's got a wife and daughter. That's, that's his perception. You know, he's, he's a professor or whatever he is, a chemist, but he's this fucking just crazy motherfucker sitting in a car getting out talking to women and then fucking checking his pulse rate. You know, each time the pulse gets a little bit lower, you know, and, and Jeff Bridges just fucking kills it, man. He absolutely fucking kills it. Like the same with his fucking daughter or whatever, to make sure that nobody can across the lake and hear his daughter scream or anybody scream, putting all these spiders in the, in the picnic basket, you know, and, and just the way he does it is just so fucking creepy, man. He chloroforms himself with a fucking yeah, stopwatch just to see how long he's fucking out from the chloroform. You know, I, I don't know, man. The, Jeff Bridges is great in this. And something else, the sweater he's wearing and this is the same sweater he wore in fucking I'm as the dude. Oh, the um, big Lebowski? Yeah, so this could be another one of those. This could be a, you know, kind of after after fucking this here. Of course, he fucking ends up dying in this movie. But if he was in this in this one here, this storyline, he lives. He could go on and say, fuck it, I'm just going to chill out and be the dude now. You know, <laughs> after being this crazy fuck. So... <laughs> But anyway, like I said, the movie is a, a really good time. It's tense as fuck. Um, everybody fucking kills it in this movie. I, I just, um, I don't know, man. I, I don't get it. I know this one had a $20 million budget, and this one here had zero budget. And like I said, I, I like both movies. If, if I, this one didn't exist, I would probably like this one a lot more. But mm-hmm. I kind of seen this one in theaters. I've seen it a bunch of times, you know, over the years. And when I seen that this was the original, I couldn't wait to watch it. And I didn't realize it was so similar in tone. It's the same fucking movie. I mean, they didn't really switch anything for the American release, even the same fucking director, like I said. Yeah. I don't know, man. It, it just bothers me a lot because the American version is so much fucking better, in my opinion. Yeah. I That's mean, and I literally took out one <laughs> and put in the other, watching back to back. So, I don't know. 
That's just my opinion. Solid choice. All right. Uh, Bass, uh, Callus, the Bass Samaritan is fire. That is on my list. On my list to watch. All right. City says my number three movie is Black Fly, 2016, directed by, directed by uh, I'm assuming that's not Jason Bourne. Jason Borky. Yeah. A tense, grim thriller. Matthew McCall, Dakota Dalby. I've done these people. Black right Fly. Out five, five out of five, though. I'll check that out. Yeah. Let's see, Frailty, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, great the stars Bill Paxton, uh, Powers Booth, and Matthew McConaughey. That's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, who's this? Jack Black getting blown apart is always a plus. <laughs> Move over before you pass out. <laughs> okay, this is, yeah, Citizen X is on Max. Unfortunately, the majority of the movies made produced for the 2000s are stuck on DVD, except for some popular TV shows to get a Blu ray treatment. He says the Jackal great movie three three point five out of five, but not better than the original. Uh, the original is a little better. I haven't seen uh, the original. That's like seventies, I think. Day of the Jackal, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, I've heard. I've of heard it. Of that. I've heard of that. I think it's a Criterion. All right. You're going to sleep with the enemy. I haven't seen that one in a while. Yeah. Um, Chris says I like the Jackal. Yeah, uh, yeah, the film's a trip. A writer says Jack Black has never elevated any movie he's been in. Not a Jack <laughs> Black fan. Damn. <laughs> it was a love the Jackal. Was surprised Jack Black was in it. Uh, it was never before was even thought of as a comedian. Yeah, he hired <laughs> Jack Black to build uh, a gun, an apparatus to mount the gun to, out of like carbon fiber or something like that. And Jack uh, Black tries to basically extort him a little bit and he doesn't do it for just no reason but kind of for no reason because he doesn't really give a fuck about the money he's getting paid handsomely for this and but he you know any opportunity to kill somebody he'll take it oh yeah plus he doesn't like anyone seeing his face either like he usually yeah. wipes out on that in his face so uh but yeah jake black's good in that role i mean for that part i think i think he was casted very well because it's just kind of like a you know kind of a doofus so it's kind of like a funny side character. It's a, it's a comic relief. It's a very tense, you know, a grim movie, and then it's a little bit of comic relief in the middle there. Yeah. yeah. Gives you a little bit of breathing room, you know, just like, oh, okay. Even though it was super tense, it was funny at the same time in a dark way. And Carl says Six Sense is a good one. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Any Shyamalan, yeah. really, you know. If you, if you yeah, consider right, Bronson. Like, is that the one with fucking Tom Holland? Ain't Tom Holland and Bronson? No, no it's like um, it's uh, Tom Hardy. Tom, that's what I meant. What I say? Yeah. What I say? You said Tom, Tom Holland. Holland. <laughs> Big difference. No, I meant I meant Tom Hardy. That's yeah. what I fucking meant. <laughs> Big Bronson. difference. Uh, Kyle says a chain with Vince. Uh, I can't ever say his name. An offer, yo. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, uh, pal. Um, however you say, is a good thriller. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, what what's the one with him and Jennifer Lopez? Um. Uh, God damn it. Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio and Jennifer Lopez. The Cell? Oh, The yeah. Cell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The Hand of the Rocks yeah. of Cradle, that's, a, that's an old one. Yeah. Rebecca D. Mornay. Rebecca Mornay's a crazy bitch in that one. Yeah. The Cell's not oh. a bad pick. You know, inside the mind of a serial killer. It's an interesting concept for a movie, yeah, too. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. yeah. The Bodyguard. Yeah. Cobra. Yeah, big old one. Could argue, yeah. yes. Not Hawks, Unhinged. Uh, Unhinged yeah. is a really good thriller. Yeah, yes. this is one here. If you guys hadn't seen, man, that's another fucking adrenaline ride right there from start to finish. Oh, that's that's a that's a really good movie. Kidnap. Uh, Enemy of the State. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a, yeah. the conspiracy thriller. Yeah, another yeah. subgenre. Yeah, Gene Hackman. Is that, that's the the day of the jackal. Yeah, Gene Hackman, uh, get ready for that news any day now. Anybody seen a recent picture of Gene Hackman? Yeah, God man. damn, man. Yeah. He's going to look good. He's going downhill fast, it looks like. Uh, okay, so back in the HD DVD days, I ordered the Jackal from Germany. HD DVD was the first format to be globally region-free. Oh. Nice. Okay. So this is Identity, four out of five. 
it's strong from Cindy. That was the Jackie Chan one. I don't know what you're talking no, about. I think he's got a movie called Jack. Well, that's, that's something else, I think. He did a good thriller called The Foreigner recently. If anybody's seen The Foreigner with Jackie Chan, he's still doing Jackie Chan shit at like 60. Know. Is that uh, the one where his, his daughter gets kidnapped or something like that? He, yeah. He gets killed in a bombing. I think the opening like a few minutes of it and I had to turn it off. Whatever. I need to go back and watch it. I, I don't yeah, he gets like it. glass in his face and yeah. you know he, he goes and go a revenge quest to get the IRA bombers back. Bro. Yeah. And it's nice seeing him in like a serious role too. There's no like, it's not like Rush Hour or no. anything like that. It's not a comedy. It's very serious. So, yeah. uh, All right. Uh, Sydney says Cold in July. I've heard of that one. Raising Cane. Raising Cane is a great one. Really good. De Palma Thriller. Yeah. The Clear and Present Danger, my favorite Jack Ryan film. Phone Booth. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Brooks. I need to see Mr. Brooks. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen him. Kevin Costner, right? That's a good call. Yeah. yeah. Kevin Costner plays a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. Bench 3.5 out of 5. He said both of them. Shooter. Yeah. Marky Mark. Yep. Y'all said, Sydney doing too much. Marky Mark sucks other than playing himself in fear. <laughs> <laughs> I like Marky Mark and Shooter, though. I think I think he's actually, I think that's a good movie. I really do. It's pretty tense. Yeah, it's the so, the count is yeah, really underrated. Yeah. See, the vanishing is is way out of print. Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to even say what I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, I got yeah, the same This release. was way out of print. I found it on eBay. Actually, it wasn't that much, really. Uh, this is the Twilight no. Time version. This was way out of fucking print. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, I couldn't find this fucking movie in my collection or whatever. So I ordered this bitch for the stream. I knew I wanted to talk about it. It was going to make my top five. And um, so I ordered this one for the stream, whatever. And then like the next fucking day after this one came in, I found this one on the fucking shelf. It was just misplaced. So I got the, like the basic bitch, you know, version of this movie and this one. So I have two of them now. So I'm gonna keep that one. I think it's got better features. On it. Does it even have features on it? I don't think so. Well, I don't think either one has really any features on it. Bitch. But this is the one that I think was is way out of fucking print. The Twilight Time one, I think. But um, anyway, I have two copies of The Vanisher now, so I may try to sell one of them. Nothing, only two copies of it. Uh, Trini says, oh, my God, Brad got pops on the Criterion hate train. Think he's up all day. I don't hate Criterion. I, I got a lot of Criterion films, but I'm going to go to my fucking grave saying the fucking American remake's better. I don't give a fuck. Money be damned. I know I one's got $20 million, but it's better actors. It's a better movie. It's more enjoyable to watch. It's not. It's not. It's not even Criterion. I like both of them. I really get, I just get tired of the relentless glad handing that these foreign films get. It's like, just because it's foreign, it's automatically two stars. Just an extra. If you're going to give it, you know, three stars, it automatically gets two because it's foreign. To some people. Some people are like that. Trini's not like that. But some people are like that. And it, it annoys me, you know, uh, a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of foreign films. I fucking love them. Yeah, but... I, I, yeah high tension. Yeah. There's and I don't hate the, the, the criterion of the vanishing. I don't. It's just not better than the American version. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, okay, also the one with more money is going to look better. So, so is Evil Dead two better than one? Curious. A lot like of people, both. yeah, a lot of people like would say Evil Dead two is better, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't. Know I've seen two either. first. I've seen two first. Then, I've, then after I went back and watched one, I've seen both of them a million times now. Well, um, if it, I if put it, it one, I watched one more than I do two. So yeah. I guess I'm gonna say I like one better. Yeah. So I like both. I prefer two. I like the remake better than all of them. The yeah, I, I love the remake. The remake's too. fucking blast, dude. I love the remake. It's one of my favorite remakes. Yeah, the 2013 and definitely my my favorite one. But it's it's kind of it's just its like own thing too, and I kind of yeah. love that about it. it's just doing its own. Yeah. It's, not really, it's not trying to copy or do or any. You know what I mean? It's just doing its own thing, and it takes just some of the stuff. You know, like the Necronomicon and some of that cool stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I love the remake, but I still got. Um, I think I still probably like the, the the original two probably a little bit better on those because when those came out back in the eighties, that's when I was getting the Fangoria magazine. It was going over all the special effects, and it was just I don't know, man. Me and all my buddies back in high school, back in the day, used to watch them all the fucking time. Probably running them a million fucking times. Oh, yeah. um, but don't get me wrong, the remake's fucking. I, I love the fucking remake. If I'm gonna do a top five remake, it's gonna be in it. Um, it all comes down to rewatchability. Which yeah, one do I want? I love the original film. Uh, State of Grace. I think I already read that one. 
Yeah, you know, Kyle says Evil Dead 2 is greater than 1. Okay, give me give me at number two, Stepfather. Stepfather. Oh, man. Fuck, I didn't think about Stepfather, but that might have made my fucking list. I love that fucking movie. Yeah. I got a bitch on the shelf right there. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah that's a great pick, Kyle. What's the good one? Uh, Chris says, someone will say my number two. Someone, someone will save my two or one, so I'm gonna. I'm not saying shit. Yeah, cool. Right, says Billy Jack <laughs> goes to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bart, Mall Cop too. There you go. Bangers. Uh, Black Fly is on YouTube. Plex and Tubi. Was it 2014 or 2016? I think. I think uh, he was saying. I'm definitely gonna check that out. It sounds pretty good. Black Fly. Yeah. Black Rain with Michael Douglas is a solid movie. That's a good I one. Just watched that. Yeah, I just watched that for the first time a few months ago, and it, it was great. Yeah. It was in Japan or something, I can't if I remember right. Yeah, Ridley Scott. Yeah. Ridley Scott. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, Andy, Andy Garcia. Garcia in that one. Andy Garcia, yeah. Andy Garcia, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Running Scare with Paul Walker is pretty good. That's a really yeah. good one, too. Very one of <laughs> That motherfucker was right there on the cusp. Yeah. <laughs> Love that Me movie. too. Dude, the, fuck, I, the fucking hockey puck scene. I just watched it uh, Wednesday night. That hockey puck scene, man. That's such a cool fucking shot with the black lights in the hockey rink. Yeah. And yeah. Goddamn, you, it's hard to look at the fucking screen. It makes my goddamn head hurt just thinking about it. Yeah. That fucking hockey puck, man, it's rough. Fucking puddle of blood there after the third hit. Yeah, oh, yeah. there'd be a, more than a puddle of blood. That would yeah. destroy your yeah. face. There's yeah. hockey yeah. pucks. He's after like, the first one, I don't think. Yeah, solid yeah. rubber. It's a good fucking movie, and then you get that fucking weird scene right in the fucking middle. Just it's like a totally different movie, you know. The, oh, fucking, the, the, the fucking pedophiles, man. What a creepy yeah. fucking scene. You know, you see the little fucking demon thing of the shadow in the background. Yeah, a couple different shots. It's a very well shot movie. You know, it is make a, a good stuff. pairing with Freeway, the first one. It would, it would, it would. And it's always funny to see Paul Walker try to play a badass. Yeah. <laughs> he does a lot of screaming in that movie. Yeah. And man, the mama from fucking the Psycho TV show, I can't ever think of her fucking name. Yeah. yeah she's like, she's got it going on. Started. Yeah. She's got it going on with that. Oh, Vera from Garrett. Yeah. Vera from That's why I don't even try. Farmiga, yeah. Blech. Yeah, she does it for me. Um, Reindeer Games is a good one. Quite cool against all odds, man. I, just, I watched that um, a few months back with the wife. Good one, Mr. Gerber. Y'all throwing some good ones out there, yeah. Uh, Callis says, Brad's spitting facts. My favorite foreign films are, are Canadian ones. Yeah. <laughs> Girl, the dragon <laughs> tattoo, yeah. The remake, uh, big. I'm a big fan of it, but there's some really great foreign films. I'm just, I, I really hate the you know, they, they treat them like they have training wheels on them, like the. Oh, great job, buddy. You made a movie. That's nice. You know, it's like, if it's really good, it's really good. Good is good and bad is bad. I mean, just because it's foreign, they, they, they automatically give it some sort of praise. That's what I'm up against, in my opinion. I just yeah. wish it would be a movie's a movie. Treat it like any other movie. Yep. River Man, what's going on, buddy? What's, what's up, up man? man? Yeah, her. That girl. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, we are moving right along, guys, up to number two. Let's see what we got. No duplicates yet. All right. And speaking of foreign films. Orphanage. Oh, <laughs> the Orphanage. This is a Spanish film from 2007, uh, directed by J.A. Boyana. Uh written uh the screenplay it's based on the screenplay which was written by uh sergio sanchez uh produced uh by uh guillermo del toro um i, I talked about this on like a on the last five or something a while back ago um i i had no intention of throwing this on this list because i, I didn't want to put any like horror films on it but uh thinking about it uh, i think it was last night um this uh and i actually found a quote to back this up 
but um, this uh, can actually be seen as uh, a supernatural, like having a supernatural element or not. Um, I've seen the uh, interview with the director um, for Fangoria. He says something, um, said uh, about the explanation of everything that happens in this film. Um, everything needed a real explanation. The ending is completely amb ambiguous. Um, it had to be, it can be viewed as a ghost story or a psychological decay of Laura, which is the main character in this, in this film. Um, and, uh, this is about, uh, a family that moves into an orphanage that the mother used to, uh, live in when she was a child before she was adopted. Um, they live there now with, uh, their adopted seven-year-old son named, uh, Simone. And, uh, he, uh, he has, he's HIV positive. Um, and since they, uh, moved into this new place, he's starting to talk to imaginary friends, which they don't think is anything really they need to be worried about until, um, uh, Simone just starts saying some really like weird shit. Um, that kids, seven-year-old kids really shouldn't be saying. And uh, one day he uh, calls his mom out on not being his real mother, um, saying that he knows that he's adopted and he knows that he's going to die soon. Um, and so uh, right about this time there, I think uh, there's like a, a caseworker that just shows up mysteriously out of the blue, some weird old lady. And uh, she's got a file on uh, Simone. And uh, she, she ends up getting kicked, thrown out of the house and then she sneaks back into like the shed later on uh, that evening in the middle of the night and she ends up running off. But um, anyway, um, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so anyway, um, Simone uh, and goes to the beach with his mother uh, one day and I, he meets a new imaginary friend. He uh, sets some seashells uh, behind him on the way home uh, so that his new friend can follow him. And uh, after that is actually when he starts saying all this weird shit. And uh, the parents think that he actually found the file on him saying that uh, he was HIV positive because he finds out. Um, and uh, uh, he ends up getting into an argument with his mom, like uh, right before they're having like a, an opening party that for this orphanage that uh, they live in, she's going to open it up and, you know, bring in uh, it's for disabled children. Um, she's going to, bring in a few new student or new children uh to this home but uh right before this party um they get into an argument and uh the mother laura smacks simone out of anger and uh tells him to go ahead and stay upstairs they're gonna party without him or whatever she goes goes upstairs later on and there's a little boy wearing a weird mask you it could be simone you don't know, but it backs her into the bathroom and uh, smashes her hand in the door and then just disappears. After that, Simone disappears. They can't find him anywhere. Um, six months goes by, nine months goes by. He's just gone. I mean, with his condition, they just kind of assume that he's dead. Um, but uh, Laura still hears noises in the house at night. And... Uh, I, don't, I guess I'll I'll pretty much leave it there. Um, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, it, it's in the same vein as um, the others or a stir of echoes. Um, no, I love stir of echoes. Um, and it's it's not horrific. Again, it's it's handled very tastefully. Um, I guess pinkies up, but just the way it's shot. I mean, out of like uh, all the projects that uh, Guillermo del Toro has been involved it with, this is one of my favorites for sure. Um, it's pretty dramatic. Um, the revelation at the end of it, when everything's kind of wrapped up, is it's pretty heavy as well. 
Um, I think he's but yeah, it's ready. a really good film. He's getting ready to remake Frankenstein, I think. Something like that. Uh no, who's do it's Maggie Gyllenhaal is doing that. What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> Maggie Gyllenhaal, really? <laughs> I don't know if they're trying to like reboot that dark universe uh oh my god, please series let again. Let well, it... uh Lay Wendell's doing uh the Wolfman. Yeah, but you don't gotta cross over and do a universe and all that shit. No. Please just yeah, just make a good movie and then just leave it alone. No <laughs> more how the, well the last time they tried that the way it just blew up in their fucking face. Oh man. Yeah. You know, I'm sure well, they'll try they want, again at some point. But they yeah, they want to set everything up like fucking Marvel now so they, they can know. have a fucking universe. Yeah. Just make one good movie. Just do that. Don't worry yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah, try it out. Yeah, but Just yeah, this is a really uh, great <laughs> uh, like ghost story. Um, works on a lot of levels, and uh, yeah, it's just a good film. It's really well done. I've literally heard nothing but great things about them. I bought yeah. the DVD just to give it kind of like a one, you know, just to watch it and see, and then if I like it, I'll upgrade it. But I've uh, I've heard nothing but great things. <laughs> you know, I highly I'm recommend it. And it, if yeah. you like that, I would give uh, the Haunting at Hill House a shot. Yep, I gotta watch that one, man. That's in the same vein as well. But I really enjoyed the others and Stir of Echoes. So yeah, this was yeah two, two yeah two thousand six. So this is a little bit later in the game, but yeah. yeah. Good pick, man. All right, you want my blood? Take my blood. The negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love that goddamn movie, dude. Yeah, this movie's just a ton of fun. I mean, this yeah. this and this is a, a major thriller. I mean, this is a thriller all the way through uh, because there's just so much tension. But I love the way they do it. I, you're never this movie's two hours and twenty minutes. You're never bored. It flies by. Um, you know, uh, Samuel L. Jackson is a hostage negotiator. And he gets set up for a murder and for stealing money out of the uh, police retirement fund. And uh, he ends up taking some hostages in this building because he knows that he's, you know, these guys are trying to set him up. And the only way he can prove his innocence is if he uncovers this, you know, this mystery, what's going on, you know, who's setting him up, who's involved in this conspiracy, basically. Um, and there's just so many actors in this. I mean, you got Paul Giamatti, you got just a bunch of like side, you got Kevin Spacey, David Morse, um, Ron Rifkin, John Spencer, JT Walsh. JT Walsh, is in it too, yeah. JT Walsh, you got him in here. I mean, it's just surrounded by all the supporting characters, everyone's a face you recognize. Um, and uh, yeah, Paul Giamatti in this film is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, the whiny bitch, you know, he, he says a lot of funny shit. He does. Like, freaking out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let my people fucking go, man. He's so excited to like, yeah, take these fucking handcuffs off. Let me go. Because he's a hostage in the movie, you know. It's so good. But um, yeah, there's a really good scene. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is where uh, Michael Cutlets is a sniper, you know. And he's obviously, all of these cops know um they all know him you know they're all they were all friends so they all know samuel L. jackson's character and there's a scene where like this glass breaks out and they're trying to you know break in and you know rescue the hostages and kill samuel L. jackson's character and everything and um michael cutlets you know he's a sniper he's got him dead to rights and they're like you know take the shot man take the fucking shot and he just cannot do it he can't do it because it's like his, it's his buddy, man. They've worked so many cases together and all this stuff. And he's like, I, you know, he, he keeps saying, you know, like copy, like okay, I copy. I understand. And the guy's saying, stop fucking saying copy and take the fucking shot. And he's like, copy, and he just he can't do it. Uh, so he just, you know, yeah, he, he just puts down the rifle and he just walks away. You know, he throws his toothpick down. Um, yeah, and there's just a lot of scenes like that. Kevin Spacey's not great in this, just as the other hostage negotiator. So you got like the fun negotiating back and forth between Samuel L. Jackson and Kevin Spacey. And they're just kind of riffing off each other. And, um, you know, they're, they're trying to one up each other in the negotiations basically. And, uh, God, man. And then you, <laughs> you got the scene with that guy, uh, his character's name's Farley. 
um, where like he's he, Samuel Jackson's telling him like you never say no. Yeah, I was just going to mention that's my favorite yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> you never say it in a negotiation. You never say no or whatever. And he just keeps saying no. And he's like, you just, just fucking killed this hostage, Farley. And I just fuck with that guy, it. dude. You're just sweating bullets. And the guy on the other line, Farley, he's just sweating bullets. He's nervous because he's never negotiated shit in his entire life. And Samuel L. Jackson's just fucking with him the whole time. And that's brilliant because it shows just how fucking, how much of an art it is to be a good negotiator. And it shows just how good Kevin Spacey and uh, Samuel Jackson are by showing somebody that really ain't good at it. Exactly. That was, that was a cool thing to do to kind of show just how great they are and what a piece of shit this other guy was. Absolutely. absolutely. But, yeah. yeah. And it's just tense all the way throughout because you're like, God, because not only do you have like the action and the, you know, the suspense and all this stuff, but then you have this mystery that you're trying to uncover too. Like, who are the cops that are involved? Like, you know, which buddies of his are they? Um, it could be anyone or multiple people. So you're trying to figure out the mystery, you know, along with them. And then, you know, you get like the, you know, he uncovers the stuff in the computer and all this, and he's interrogating the guy and he's interrogating JT Walsh's character. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's like, Oh, your eyes moved up into the left. So you're lying, you're fucking lying or whatever. And then he's like, it's not just when your eyes move. It's like you scratch your ass, you're, you're move your hands around, you're moving around your seat. It's anything I can tell whether you're lying. You can't beat the system. He's just fucking you can Look at me with those dead ass eyes all you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. I know you're fucking lying. Um, yeah, man, that's, that's a great one. That's, so a, yeah, that's a hell of a pick, man. The negotiator number two. How mad I didn't pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, number two. Uh, this is from 2004, directed by Jonathan Demme. It's uh, the Manchurian Candidate. It's the mm -hmm. remake uh, to the original. Really uh, underrated, and I and I think overlooked, but I can I can guess why. Uh, it's a Denzel Washington movie. This was the this was the poster art. What the fuck is that? Who thought this was a good idea? It, this looks like. Disney remaking powder. I mean, what is the point of this? <laughs> yeah. Like, who would to see this and go, "Oh, I want to see that." Let's run to. The oh, everybody theater. loves White Denzel. Denzel. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I just got it. I've never seen it, and that poster might be a big reason for it. Yeah, so but, I really like the appreciate the slip. This is more of what the movie's about. It's a political conspiracy thriller. Uh, Denzel Washington obviously stars. A uh, little uh, factoid with this movie. If you watch this movie, you'll notice Denzel Washington's, I believe it's his right hand, is like kind of deformed or he has an issue with it. Of the One of his pinky points straight down. And Denzel Washington actually has an issue with his hand. And they he's an injured um, captain in the military. And they actually let that go in the movie instead of like fixing it or editing it out or whatever. It, it point, his pinky points straight down. And it's part of his character. He, he's not playing Joe Cool in this like he normally p plays. He's not playing a Mr. Badass. He's trying to get his shit together basically the whole movie. But, uh, you know, like I said, 2004, Jonathan Demme takes place and shot all around the D.C. area, all the way to New York. Uh, a lot of Jonathan Demme staples for the ensemble cast. You know, you'd recognize a lot of people from Silence of the Lambs in this movie. Um Roger Corman even has a cameo in this from he was in Silent Slams also, but Roger Corman, obviously a horror director. Uh, but this was Jonathan Demme's last feature. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of interest. To, it's interesting that it was his last feature. He went on to make indies and stuff after this, but very successful uh, director now doesn't do movies anymore. Weird. But uh, Denzel Washington is great in this as uh, Major Marco. What it is, is. It opens on Major Marco, who has a battalion of, like, Special Forces guys, and they're ambushed. And uh, Lee Schreiber basically saves them all. He's one of the members, but he's kind of like the outcast in the group, kind of the weirdo in the group. And he saves them and gets the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, his mother, played by Meryl Shreep, who's the slimiest, most reptilian person on the planet, perfectly cast for that character, Gets him into politics, and later he becomes the vice presidential nominee after you know his war service and all that stuff. And there's a big element of conspiracy. I'll try not to spoil it uh, as much as I can. Great cast. Again, John Voight, uh, Lee Schreiber, Jeffrey Wright is really great in this. 
what it is is these battalion members, the surviving battalion members, all have the same dream, and they come together and try and you know try and figure it out why that is, and they're they're fuzzy on the events of what happened, and it turns out that uh, there's like a huge mind control element. It's very very political. It's very extremely dark. Like you wouldn't think, oh Denzel or whatever. This is one of the darkest conspiracy movies you can see. It's uh, creepy as hell, and um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to go really further. I feel like a lot of people haven't seen it. I don't want to spoil it, but uh, great thriller. Uh, really, a lot of I feel predictive programming for <laughs> a lot of stuff that has happened is in this, you can see in this movie and go, okay, weird because that that just something very similar to that just happened uh, almost. So uh, very uh, heavy mind control, you know. Like I said, very dark conspiracy, government conspiracy cover ups that whole bit. But yeah, uh, check out this Kino. This 4K looks incredible from Kino. Uh, it's all ported over features, unfortunately, um, but. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a solid release and a really cool. Um, also, check out the original. I think it's uh, Frank Sinatra, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, this is a first class uh, production, and uh, I don't know why more people haven't seen it, but it's a lot of fun. Well, a lot yeah, of. Uh, I, I just got mine in. Yeah, on, we'll check it out. Hmm. When you were describing that, it kind of sounds a little bit like because um, I haven't seen that movie yet, it, but it kind of sounds like Jacob's Ladder a bit with the like soldiers and then they're all having the same dreams and it's like, mm-hmm. uh, it's got a little like kind of that aspect to it or whatever. So it's like, yeah, it's like, well, I'm it's sure like, it's way different. It's just yeah, like well, I mean, there is, it's the government. Yeah. There's right. similar stuff. MK ultra and all that is it's all in there. Um, but, yeah. uh, it's just, I always bring it up because Jonathan Demi's obviously a big time talent and he's, his career was like over after this. Like Damn. he did do independent documentaries and things like that, but he never did another studio release. Somebody didn't like this. Uh, that's yeah. the way I looked at it. But uh, I, I've I've been looking for an upgrade for that for years. I'm very happy with that release. Would like seeing some new features, but I'm happy enough with a real nice scan of it. Yeah. I look forward to checking that one out. Yeah, it's a good one. All right, my number two, and this actually, um, I watched this. I finished it. I've seen it a million times. I finished it about twenty minutes before the stream started, and it knocked out one of my other picks. So um, I, I fucking love this movie. I'm not ashamed at all. Of signs. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, my number two, dude. It's such a fucking good movie. Um, Mel Gibson, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, two of my favorites. And it's um, on this rewatch here. Something I really paid attention to are the two kid, uh, the two kid actors. Um, uh, Rory Culkin, man, he's fucking great in this. Mm-hmm. Um, Abigail Breslin, which I didn't realize this, but this is her first role. She was the girl that played um, Little Rock in Zombieland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the two little girls. Little this Miss is Sunshine. Her first role. Yeah, and um, man, this movie is so fucking well done. Um, I really like the Unbreakable and, and you know and, and Split and all that. But this might be my favorite um, M Night movie. Um, man, it's um, it's it's just so fucking well done from the opening shot. And there's something about this, kind of like in the same vein as The Shining or whatever, the music in this is done so well to build up the tension. You know, and the sounds of the movie are, are done so well. Listen to this on a really good sound system. You know, yeah. there's so many things in the movie where you hear crickets and then you don't hear crickets. Just little things like that. And when the crickets go away, you know something, somebody's fixing to get fucked. Something's mm-hmm. fixing to happen. You know, and there's, there's, like I said, the agony is fucking phenomenal. It wastes no time. Um, it's a very, it's a little off kilter type movie. Like for example, they're sitting around the table having a conversation with a cop, you know, and they're trying to, trying to, you know, let her know that they've seen somebody outside the night before. And you just, the conversation is just a little off kilter, but that kind of works in, in this movie because it makes it feel just a little more creepy. You're a little bit more on edge the whole movie. Cause you're just not quite sure what to fucking expect. Um, I don't know, man. I say this with my son. I ain't gonna tell the story. You know, I've told it a million times. I said it on my son like it was like his 11th birthday, um, and it freaked him the fuck out. Um, and he's watched a lot of fucked up shit. He's, he, told me, he told me in this movie here, he says, Pop, I, I'm ready to go home. That, that scene <laughs> everybody that I'm talking about with the fucking aliens birthday scene. Yeah. Um, and I took a note That's a great it, reveal. Um, yeah. Oh, man, that was a, f- a fantastic reveal. Um, um, what was it? I wrote down about that. Oh. Uh, the birthday party scene in this movie has been named one of the scariest scenes of all time by movie critics. Now, I don't believe that, but 
it is definitely a very memorable scene. You know, and Joaquin Phoenix just sells it. You know, he's in the fucking room. He's in the fucking closet watching the TV. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's freaking the fuck out. He's such a good fucking actor. I don't give a fuck. He might be my favorite actor working today. He's um, screaming he's at the TV in Spanish. Yeah, like, yeah, like, 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 hear him. He's, talking, he's speaking in their language, so they can understand it. You know, he's, yeah. that scene when they walk in and all three of them got the, the fucking, um, the fucking tenfold hats on. Oh, yeah, man. Okay. And, um, and something about Bill Gibson that I love so much, whatever, you know, M. Night's got a part in this. You know, he, he plays basically the person that, ran, that killed his wife in a car accident. And when he's trying to apologize to Bill Gibson, and Mel Gibson starts getting upset, and he's trying not to cry. Or mm-hmm. try, he's such a that's when Mel Gibson fucking shines for me, you know. Um, he's just he's such a just a, he's just a fucking great actor. I don't give like him like him as a person. Shit, you've heard about him in real life. I don't give a fuck. He's a great fucking actor. And yeah, he's a great director. Oh yeah, and he acts his ass off in this. I mean, everybody acts their ass off in this. Um, you know, it's got funny scenes in it. It's got a lot of tension in it. It's got some creepy ass scenes in it. Um, the, the down in the basement, you're down in the basement, whatever you know. Oh the yeah, first time. Oh, you're a dumbass dad, whatever. You've got to get your kid's asthma medication. Yeah. You, know, you fix to go in the fucking bunker, basically, and you forget to get his asthma meds. Yeah. But anyway, that's a great fucking tense scene. You know, the whole movie, like I said, is it is phenomenal. Um, and and I didn't even think about it when I was doing my thrillers, whatever, and I was kind of going through this afternoon. And I said, Well, fuck signs is a fucking thrill. Let me watch that again. And I watched it like it was the first time I ever seen it. Yeah. You know, that's just that's that's the sign of a great movie. Um yeah, man, I love it. And it's number two. It just about got moved up to number one. But that's what I got. Awesome choice, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very well done. If you haven't seen Signs in a while, man, give it a rewatch, man. It's fuck, it's, it's just so due good. for an upgrade, too. I mean, you would think that would be a 4K yep. by now. Yep. Oh, it's something else I wanted to mention. Um, and this ain't a big deal, whatever. This is the second movie. Um, that M. Night, well, this is the first time he's ever done it, but he's done it twice. Where Water was the weakening agent for the person yeah. in the movie, you mm-hmm. know, this one, of course, Water is the weakness for the aliens. And then, you know, of course, you got um, what's his nuts, unbreakable guy, yeah, Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis. But his, his character's name, whatever, in, the, in those movies, what I, I wrote it down on there somewhere, the overseer, uh, David Dunn, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to see if I put it, got any notes I'm gonna, I want to go over before we move on, um. I think I think I covered about everything. Anyway, I, I fucking love it, man. Every time I watch it, I just fall in love with it all over again. It's like I won't watch it for three years and I don't think about it. Then I watch it again and go, fuck, I should watch this every year. I should watch this every couple months. Yeah. You know, it, it never gets old. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> He's like, I'm I'm with anger. <laughs> Dude, that that dinner table scene too, when they're all eating dinner and like, well, if you guys aren't going to eat, then I'll just go ahead and have a little bit of. Oh, you are yourself, yeah. yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying, man. The two kid actors of that man, they fucking killed it, man. And I guess I'm always so paying, paying so much attention to Joaquin and, and Mel Gibson and that. The kid actors are fucking they killed it. Yes, and yeah, they really do. And that little girl, man, that's the first role, you know, but. Yeah, it's, I think it's a very early role for Joaquin Phoenix too. I don't, I don't remember him being much else before that. Yeah, well, he was a kid actor. He was in, he was in stuff before that, whatever. But nothing that might be the first really big thing he's ever done. At least I know he was in the first ever seen him was fucking Space Camp. He was like fucking eight, <laughs> maybe <laughs> not eight, nine, or ten something. While like he was a kid, but um. All right, I think we left off here. Riverman says, uh, y'all get anything in on the Kino sale? Or, or did you already talk about that? No, we haven't talked about that. I got like eight things in my car right now. I think that, I that got goes, things in my car. I think it goes to like the end of April, don't it? But um, I'll yeah. go through and add a, add a couple more things, whatever. But I I keep telling myself, there can't be anything else I fucking want, man. I got so many fucking titles from Kino in these last few <laughs> sales. Don't say that, man. I always find that. That. So that last time we got 24 titles. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got a few things coming in. I already placed my order, so but I might. Yeah, I haven't placed my order yet, but I, I'm still adding to it. But I'm I'm gonna do it soon. Yeah. Kal right, says, uh, "Good is good, exactly. They feel privileged, like they're beyond reproach if you don't like them." Yeah. It's yeah. True. Good is good. Exactly. I agree. I yeah. agree. The original one, "A Stranger Calls," and "The Eyes of Laura Mars." Solid. Yep. Said he says my number two is Nocturnal Animal Animals, um, directed by Tom Ford. 
Twisted Thriller with Amy Adams, Jake Gyllenhaal. When you love someone, you can't just throw it away for 4.5 out of 5. I got I to gotta check that one out. I still haven't seen it. I know that came out, right, 2016. I, I... Yeah. Yeah. I don't own it. I got it on my Voodoo. I need to check it out. I got a just, real cheap Voodoo one night, and I never got around to watching it. Yeah, just the cast alone. I mean, it's got Jake Gyllenhaal, you know, so he's done quite. I mean, did Prisoners and Nightcrawler, yeah. and you know, so. Yeah, Chris, those those are both amazing. Um, said so the Negotiator, great movie, four out of five. Yes. Yep. Trini says nice pick, Anthony. Thanks, Trini. Negotiator is a good one. Kyle says, okay, number one is Unlawful Entry. And the Book of Eli, truly two of my favorite movies. Yeah, uh, Kal-El, um, I actually had the unlawful entry in my, in my top five until I watched Breakdown. Um, when I watched Breakdown, it kicked it out and break, Breakdown replaced it. Um, yeah. I love both of them, but um, Breakdown just held up a little bit better for me. Because of the powder is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the Manchurian Candidate remake, great movie, 4.5 wow. out of 5. The original is a 5 out of 5. Wow. Damn. Man. Okay. Not Both really are Kino 4Ks. Oh, um, really? They have the first one, too? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, so you're right, Brad. I, I, I never saw it because of the poster. <laughs> That's a terrible poster. It is an awful poster. <laughs> like, well, 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 62, never saw the remake, Wild Wrangler said. Chris <laughs> says, mind control isn't real, Brad. Now drink some more fluoride. Floor, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sydney says, Signs, great movie, 4.5 out of 5, one of the best movies by M. Not. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It could be his best, really. Rewatch Signs last year, and it's so excellent, 4.5 out of 5. Yep. I guess I need to rewatch Signs, never cared for it. Um, never cared for it was pretty good despite the hate. Yeah, give it a rewatch, Cal, because that's one of those movies I feel like does benefit when you watch it again. I really do. Give it a rewatch, man. Yeah, Kyle says never never care for old was pretty good despite the hate. Whatever old was okay. It just, I, I mean, it. it's gonna be close to the bottom of my of my M Night movies, but um, it was okay. But yeah, signs is, is definitely my favorite one. It's got to be. Yeah, signs the alien creepy. Oh yeah. Uh, is Mr. Majestic a good movie? Got it in my card on Kino. It's a Charles Bronson movie. Yeah, I haven't seen it in fucking years. I, I, I got the movie on my shelf over there from Kino, but um, yeah, it's a good Charles Bronson movie. If you like Charles Bronson, um, ask Chris in the chat, whatever, see what she says. <laughs> yeah, and all the uh, Death Wish movies that Kino has, they're, they're all part of that sale as well. well so. They, they got to have most all of Charles Bronson movies now. They got a ton of them. Yeah. You need Death Hunt on okay from them. Yeah, I saw they had the Death Wish 4K, which still had the slip. That was on sale for seventeen ninety nine, and then they had Death Wish. I think it was four and five um, Blu rays. Yeah, because I know it's weird because I think the other two are owned by different companies or something. I think two and three oh. are owned by some other company. <laughs> it's it's weird how they're split up. You can get three through Scorpion, I think. Okay. Well, there you go, Chris. There's Chris there. <laughs> Mr. Majestic is one of Bronson's best. I'm a huge Bronson fan. It's necessary. Yeah. Right on cue. Chris says, oh, Chris C says, brother, there's a lot of Chris's around. Well, Chris C says, brothers is a good thriller. I remember Nocturnal Animals be, um, being really good. I saw that one in theaters. Oh, cool. Okay. He also says, uh, Kurt versus Ray over Breakdown. Ray is unbelievable. Love that film when he's screaming yeah it's, it's good i love i love ray Liotta, but um just when i watched them both i watched them both in the same week whatever i just enjoyed um i just don't break that a little more i, I love i've been thinking i got it right over there i love an awful entry i love ray Liotta. i think he's great in that uh Kyle says ray been been telling y'all about karen since an awful entry <laughs> uh, so i'm gonna mark it there and we are moving on to number one nice What you got, Steve? All right. Um, and again, like I'm not a huge Guillermo del Toro fan. And uh, this movie isn't even horror. But uh, this movie I thought was fucking awesome. Nightmare Alley. Released in 2021. Uh, two and a half hours. Uh, directed by Guillermo del Toro. Um, Bradley Cooper, Rooney Mara, Kate Blanchett, Tony Collette, Richard Jenkins, Ron Perlman, Willem Dafoe, 
Um, really good cast. It's uh, kind of like a neo noir uh, remake um, of a movie. Uh, it has a Criterion release. The original is good too, but um, I don't know. But this whole movie is just like live action art. The way everything is looked, the set decoration, um, I don't know, costumes, production design. Um, but it, it's basically, it starts off with, uh, it takes place in, I believe, uh, the beginning of the 1940s. Uh, but Bradley Cooper is dragging a body into a a wrapped up body into a cellar and setting like a, like a shack on fire and walking away from it. He ends up uh, catching a train to a circus and, uh, doing odd jobs around there to kind of like make ends meet. Um, he ends up working his way up, uh, through like the circus community or whatever, and befriending Tony Collette's character and her husband. Um, and uh, they were like a mentalist couple. They had an act um, with the circus. Um, I don't know, like uh, parlor tricks, like uh, guessing shit about people in the audience or, you know, uh, a loved one wants to reach out to shit like that. Um and uh, they end up kind of showing him the art of doing this. And uh, the uh, husband actually has a book all about all this. Like everything's jotted down. Um, and they, they're, they're gradually showing him the ways, whatever. Um, the husband ends up dying. Um, and uh, Tony Collette en ends up giving him the book. So he, uh, he kind of knows... Um, how to put this act together. So he uh, convinces Rui Mara's character. She's a, uh, like a sideshow um, in the circus uh, to run off with him and uh, do this act. It's a mentalist act, same shit. They're, uh, you know, uh, working their way up to like uh, hotels and ritzy places. Um, just, just doing their thing. But uh, when, he was being taught all this stuff. He was warned, uh, don't do a spook show, meaning, um, don't, don't do like the, uh, you know, your dead aunt wants to reach out to you shit like that. He says it, it always ends up bad. So, um, he ends up befriending, uh, Kate Blanchett's character. Um, and she is a psychologist and, uh, I don't know. Uh, she's kind of plugged in and she, she knows like a lot more about like upper people, like in the, uh, upper echelon people in the community. Um, and, uh, he, he, uh, he starts doing his spook show shit. Um, Rooney Mara doesn't agree with it at first, but he's, he's doing it with one guy in particular. And then he moves on to uh, Richard Jenkins' character, who is really trying to uh, channel and contact his dead wife. And he's a man with a lot of money and a lot of power. And uh, he keeps giving Bradley Cooper's character a lot of money, you know. And uh, he, Bradley Cooper's doing his shitty parlor tricks. And eventually, uh, Richard Jenkins gets fed up and he wants to see some results. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he doesn't exactly see what he wants to see and yeah, everything kind of goes south. Um, one thing about this movie, uh, I really like, uh, well thought out endings and this one's a fucking doozy. Like everything's just, it, it, it's a perfect circle. Um, the way the, uh, the movie ends. Uh, but yeah, great performances. Everything looks cool. Um, and yeah, I, I, I highly recommend it. I've heard of it, but never seen it. Yeah, Sounds it's a dark good. movie, man. It, it's really good. If you like, uh, I don't know, like Nor pictures, stuff like that, I would check it out. Mm. Add to my list. Now look at this sorry, miserable, squashed thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 
man, just an ordinary man, just trying to make his way home. <laughs> That's all he wants. To... Michael Douglas just wants to go home. You know, he's having a really bad fucking day, stuck in this <laughs> hot heat, no air conditioner, stuck in traffic, and you know, he just gets out of his car. And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going home. That's it. Yeah, uh, and along the way, he meets, you know, different people and has has a lot of. Uh, crazy altercations you know such as this guy that's working at the store and you know michael douglas just needs some change so he can you know call his ex-wife and uh you know, he, he just, yeah he just goes to this convenience store and like oh you know and the guy tells him like oh no you gotta buy something you know and he's like okay i'll buy this soda you know and the, you know he's like okay i'll just get some change for this he's like 85 cents the guy tells him behind that he's like 85 cents and Michael Douglas is like, well, that's not going to be enough change for me to use the phone. I need 25 cents change back or whatever. He's like, oh, 85 cents. <laughs> this guy keeps fucking telling him. <laughs> he's like, you know, and then, you know, he accuses Michael Douglas of being a criminal and all this. He's like, no, you're the fucking crit criminal. You're the one charging 85 cents for a goddamn, you know, soda. <laughs> you know, and he just takes the guy's baseball bat and just starts wreck wreaking havoc in his store and taking everything down. He's slashing prices, basically. Um... I, I just love. I mean, there's this. I mean, it's just scene after scene of perfection, you know, as he's just going through. And I love how every time he meets up with someone else, he collects like a new item, <laughs> like a new weapon, like Grand Theft Auto or some shit. So he, yeah, he gets, he gets the baseball bat from that the convenience store owner. Korean then, guy. Yeah, the Korean dude. Yeah, and he's just then he goes and he moves on. And he runs into these two uh gang members you know and shit because he's just trying to take a seat rest you know he's got a fucking hole in his shoe he's just trying to rest and these guys are like fucking with him saying like oh you're on our turf man what are you doing here you know you got to pay the toll and all this shit and i love michael douglas just takes that fucking bit of he's like i got your toll right here motherfuckers <laughs> and just starts beating you the forgot the briefcase you forgot the briefcase <laughs> clear a path motherfucker yeah, you forgot your briefcase motherfuckers make a path assholes make a fucking path i'm going home. i'm going home yeah. You got the Nazi fuck whatever. You the same, me and you. That like fucking yeah. crazy fuck, you know? <laughs> And now he gets a butterfly knife. <laughs> so yeah. now, he's got a, so you know, now he's got the butterfly knife, so he keeps upgrading his uh, weapons, you know. Oh, man. And you just keep going and going. And then those same guys try to meet him and shoot him in the streets, you know, have like a drive-by or whatever. And, uh, of course, they miss because they can't shoot worth of shit. They're just spraying fucking machine guns all over, hitting all these innocent people. <laughs> they can't hit him. They got a million fucking bullets going everywhere, and they can't even hit him. And then they crash their car because they're a bunch of dumbasses. Michael Douglas goes up there, takes their bag of guns, takes his machine gun or whatever, and he's just, like, pointing at it, and then just shoots him right in the fucking leg, and he's like... Uh, what does he say? Get target practice, asshole, or something like that, or learn how <laughs> yeah. to shoot an asshole, or something like that. <laughs> it's so fucking good, man. And uh, you know, it just it just goes throughout that. And I, you know, Robert Duvall is excellent in this film as well. I mean, Michael Douglas steals every scene, you know, but I, I love Robert Duvall's character because he's just kind of like the every you know everyday guy, or whatever. Well, he's, he's, his last day is a police officer. His, his wife, wife, his wife is crazy. Yeah. His wife is something his wife else. Is crazy as shit, you know. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> and he's got to deal with that, and then he's just trying to like get through his one last day of work. But you know, now he's you know got the biggest case of his life, really. And um, God, man, you, then you got the army surplus store owner, you know, which is like, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say all of his dialogue, okay, right now, Alan. So. Uh -huh. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, not so, you know, my channel. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> fucking, that character can't even exist in uh, 2024. And apparently, that character lives in like downtown LA. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't last long. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you got the store for free or something. Yeah. <laughs> not really buying it. But man, yeah, he just runs in all these guys and it's just going. But the thing I love about it too is like he's. You know, he doesn't even he doesn't see himself like a, as a villain at all, and he's not really like doing. He's just so sick of seeing like you know the shittiness of the world, and he's just had enough. He's just like tired of it, you know, because there's just so much out there, and he's, he really just wants to be with his wife and kid. But you know, he's got a little bit of a temper, <laughs> you know, and shit. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, by the end of it, you know, you got Robert Duvall and him standing off, and he's like, "I'm the bad guy." You know, like I'm the like he he doesn't even realize that the whole time he's like I'm the bad guy, you know, and 
I don't know. I, I just love it because there's just so much going on. It's it's very suspenseful, but it's also got a lot of other things going on too. So, um, yeah, that's that's falling down, man. That's my number one. You know, I, and I feel like this movie, even though I always think of it as a classic in my mind, I don't think a lot of people know about this one. Yeah, still, I, I never hear it brought up in conversations or anything. Really, it's weird. But this is like a classic movie in my mind. Like this oh, should yeah. have some premium yeah. second sight edition or something crazy because there 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 are a lot of layers to this, you know, just like a normal guy and he's just breaking down mentally. I mean, you've seen this in some newer movies. The they kind of try to do similar to the fan. Yeah, the, the fan, fan is kind of a similar yeah. Yeah, another good nineties thriller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, another really good one. And just, you know, yeah, I mean there's, there's a lot of layers to this movie, but it blends the the suspense and the drama and the the comedy and all that so well that you know it, I don't know. I love it. But tell, yeah, that's tell me what you're doing to the street. What are you doing to the street? What are you doing to the street? That, that's the thing. <laughs> you can talk about every single section of this movie. Yeah. It's so hard not to because, like, every part is very memorable. I, right. Like, tell me, yeah, tell, right. What's wrong with the street? What's wrong with it? There's nothing. He breaks up the fucking rock. Yeah. I'll give you something. There's nothing good. wrong with it. Okay, you're right. It's and, like, I knew it. I knew there was nothing wrong with and, it. And Brad, Brad tells me a lot that me and this guy have a lot in common. And <laughs> I don't necessarily want to agree with him, but there's a lot of things that happens to this guy in the movie that, as an old guy, I can relate to. Yeah. Anybody can fucking, any y'all probably can remember. Right. Like, the fast yeah, I'm walking into the fucking restaurant and it's two minutes past whatever, and it's like, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things I can kind of relate to. He's my spirit animal. One of my family. Shoots up a fast food restaurant because they wouldn't serve him breakfast. Yeah. Two minutes <laughs> past the time. I would, I would never do any of this shit, whatever, but I ain't going to say that. It's not in my mind sometimes. <laughs> Let's say that. And that's the All thing, too. Right, and then you're allowed to think about it. <laughs> it's it's funny as fuck too because then he he changes his mind. He's like, you know what? I think I will have some lunch because he looks around and sees everyone else eating lunch. <laughs> he yeah. changes his mind. You know what? Lunch does look good. Yeah. <laughs> and then the old guys in the golf cart, you know that they're trying to hit him with the fucking golf yeah. ball or whatever. Yeah. He's like four. Now you're with that stupid fucking hand on Murphy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, now you're gonna die with that stupid little yeah, <laughs> yeah. funny little hand. Die with that. What a stupid hat. Yeah, right? That stupid little hat on. Yeah. <laughs> it's you like, know. my pills, my pills, pills. And the golf cart has his pills. And it's just going down yeah. the thing into the water. <laughs> oh, man. It's every scene. You can talk about every scene in that movie. Yeah, man. That's oh, a good one. Old. Another one. Kino 4K. Another, yeah, absolutely. yeah, that needs a release, okay. too. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Well, I've never gotten any good feedback. Well, that's not true, Anthony. And Steve both liked it. Alan did not like this movie, but uh, I could not leave it off my list. Uh, 2018, The Standoff at Sparrow Creek. Oh, um, yeah. yeah was this is definitely you know, my kind of movie. I will uh, freely admit that, that it's not for everybody. Um, you you kind of have to be familiar with the subculture. I you know, sent Anthony a copy. He's from Michigan. I sent Dr. Ordinary a copy. He's from Michigan. They get it. Uh, this movie takes place in Michigan. It's shot in and around Dallas, Texas, though. Uh, written and directed by Henry Dunham, first time writer, first time director. Uh, the, the cast is these seven men at the top here. Um, you probably won't recognize their names, but you would recognize their faces. They're it's all it's a cast full of that guys, what I call them, that guys. Uh -huh. Oh, that guy yeah. from you know, such and such. The, the biggest name would be James Badge Dale. He's been in a bunch of stuff. I mean, if you, you Google that guy, you'll see him. But what it is is seven militia members um, meet at a lumber yard warehouse to, uh, because of a mass uh, shooting event, mass killing event. It's not even a shooting. There's bombs. There's all sorts of things happening. On a cop's funeral takes place. That, that prior to that day, and they meet to discuss, you know, what they should do. Are they going to get blamed for it? What's going on? And they decide they're going to clean out the armory because they obviously have automatic weapons they shouldn't have. Automatic, automatic weapons have been banned since 1986 with the Brady Law. They have grenades. They have things they shouldn't have. So they decide they're going to clean out the armory. They go to the armory. One rifle's missing. Some grenades are missing. Some explosives. Some body armor's missing. 
and they decide very quickly that one of the seven men had committed this act, and they want to find out who it is and turn him over to the cops, suicide him, whatever they have to do to get the blame off of them so they don't all go down. So it's a cat and mouse kind of thing. They're trying to interrogate each other, trying to figure it out. Plus, these are all like very unsavory, very dangerous characters. And they're all like basically locked in this warehouse together. And of course, the police know about the militia and are already are, are on them from the beginning. And uh, they're trying to deal with that. They're trying to uncover who the killer is. And uh, it's a very high tension type thing. Uh, I don't know. You just have to get to, I feel like this movie was made for me. Uh, that's the way I look at it. It's my kind of movie. Very gritty. Uh, what drew me into it. I blind bought this from uh, Hampton book, you know, from the producer of bone Tomahawk. I loved the cover art, gave it a shot, loved it. And um, I won't get into any kind of spoilers, but it's very much, you know, false flags. It has all kinds of things in it. And uh, I'd recommend checking out stream it. Obviously, uh, like I said, I haven't had good feedback from it uh, necessarily. Alan told me it took him like three or four times to get through it. <laughs> so I can't follow sleep, but that doesn't say it's a bad movie. Yeah, just, you know. uh, great soundtrack in this. I mean, the soundtrack yeah. is very hip and you know very. I don't think there's one chord that's played in the movie. I mean, it, it has zero. It, it's ominous tones at best. Yeah, throw on your fucking iPod if you want a soundtrack, because there ain't one in the fucking movie. <laughs> uh, I, I hope this guy does more stuff, uh, this Henry Dunham guy. Um, but, you know, uh, got a great cast together. It's got the guy from... Um, he's my favorite character in it. He plays the no gas station... No Country for Old Men. Yeah, the gas station clerk from No Country for Old Men. We close it dark, that guy. He's no. in it as this ex highwayman that's uh, that murdered a man. And they're all killers and they're all, you know, unsavory guys. And uh, it, it's just a very, very serious movie, very stoic movie. But I enjoyed it. And I'm sure you can probably watch it on YouTube for free. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's my number one. Yeah, I really liked all the interrogation scenes and everything that go throughout that movie because it's very, it is very dialogue heavy. I mean, that's what the movie is. But it's, yeah. I think dialogue's pretty spot on, you know, and it's just like an interrogation after an interrogation, and it's like you're trying to uncover the mystery along with them. So. Yeah, and it's just it's building towards a crescendo, yeah. and uh, you know, there's like I said, there's a twist to it. But I, yeah, the interrogation at the beginning with that. The redheaded, uh, the big redheaded guy. You've seen him in a bunch of stuff. Happy, whatever his name is, and they just like they drag a, just a deer corpse down there. They're like they have him interrogated. They have him stapled. They have him tied to this chair, and they like hey, go bring that bring that deer corpse. They're all deer hunters and stuff. He's like, yeah, get that buck out of the bed. We don't want, you know, we don't want to draw attention. Whatever, bring the buck down here. And he just starts dissolving the deer right in front of uh, the guy that he's about to interrogate. Like, if the answers don't add up, you're going to be next is the you know the idea behind it but anyway yeah i'm not expecting everybody to like that movie i just uh, really enjoy it there you go measure your list yeah all right my number one is the hitcher yeah it's a great pick yeah um it's a classic one day we're gonna get a 4k right now we're gonna i got this um really cool german german media book here um but if for whatever reason, it comes with two extra discs in the back, which is fairly odd. You got the um, <laughs> Inferno Thunderbolt and a movie called <laughs> Catcher. No, no idea. Two DVD, random DVDs stuck in the back of this release from Germany. But um, really cool release, though. So if we get the 4K, that's what I got. But Hitcher, enough about the release. Everybody knows this movie. Everybody's waiting for it to come out on 4K. It's a classic. Roker Howard, C. Thomas Howell. Um, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, um, opening scene, you got C. Thomas Howe going down the road, picks up a fucking hitchhiker. Of course, this motherfucker's luck has got to be fucking Rutger Hauer. <laughs> and <laughs> that whole fucking opening scene in the fucking car, you know what you're in for. Yeah. You, know, you, you ever seen, you ever see what happens when an eyeball gets punctured? You know, you got the yeah. fucking knife. And C. Thomas Howe was scared to death of, of, of Rutger Hauer. He said, I was scared <laughs> to death. Because you have C. Thomas Howe just coming off doing The Outsiders. When he did this, you know, and you have he's just a little old guy, you he know. He was a kid, Tom yeah, Howell, like seventeen. Crazy looking fuck, you know, and he's he's a, he's a, he's he's very much a character actor. So he really got into this character, and see Thomas House said he was just scared to death of him, you know, throughout the movie. And um, he's a very menacing fucking person in, in this. He's so it's almost like he's that's how you perceive the movie. It's almost like he's a ghost 
yeah. you know, or something, see something supernatural. Way. You see, just always pop up at the right times or the mm-hmm. wrong times. I even go look at it, but um, it's a it's a very um, it's a very different type of film. Um, I said it at a very young age. Used to come on HBO all the time. It's an HBO Films um, presentation, whatever. Um, it's a very different type of movie. It's got a very gritty feel to it. Um, it's the, I think it's the, it, it definitely is the best thing C. Thomas Howell's ever done. I think. Yeah. Um, a lot of people might see the outsiders, but this is my favorite thing C. Thomas Howell's ever done. Now that he's done a ton of stuff, but um, and Rutger Hauer was was made for this part. But even though that being the case, whatever. Uh, originally, this part was going to go to Sam Elliott. Um, imagine Sam Elliott playing playing the hitcher, and I'm going to read this about that. Or thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the the producer um, was going to get Sam Elliott for the role. John Ryder. Um, Hauer states in his, in his autobiography, whatever that says. Apparently, um, Sam Elliott was so scary when he came in to audition that Ed- Edward S. Feldman was afraid to go out to his car afterwards. Sam Elliott had a scheduling conflict, so he had to back out of the role. But supposedly Sam Elliott came in and killed the role so bad, the fucking producer was scared to walk out to his fucking car after the fucking audition. <laughs> I would That's like to see that. I, said a lot. <laughs> I don't think Sam um, Elliott has ever played a villain in a movie nah. before. I don't think, I, not that I could think of on top of my head. Um, Entertainment Weekly said this was the 19th scariest movie of all times. I don't know if I agree with that, but it's definitely got a creep factor to it. Yeah. Um, Road through. Yeah, this guy just put C. Thomas Howell through hell, dude. I mean, just, and nah. he's on setting him up to be the bad guy. You know, but at the same time, whatever, you know, when he gets to the point where he's going to be caught, he always fucking breaks him out just so he can fuck with him some more. Yeah. You know, he's like, I want to keep fucking with you. It's like a cat hit with a ball of yarn or fucking right. with a dead mouse. You don't want to let the motherfucker go. You're having a good time with him. You can't ever yeah. quite figure out why he's he's so attached to this kid, whatever. But he's just fucking with him left and right. And um, but yeah, there's some there's some pretty brutal scenes in it. Um, I think Jennifer Jason Lee's fine for for her role playing Nash, whatever you know. Um, if you if you know, you know what happens to her at the end. It's pretty fucked up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a solid movie. It's 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 just tension fucking throughout. Um, it's, it's definitely one of my favorite thrillers. And after rewatching it again, it just re- reconfirmed it. It was my number one. Um, but, but I will say after watching the signs, signs just about beat it to number two, but, yeah. um, but yeah, man, this is, um, it's a fantastic movie. It's, I think it's going to look great on 4k. Um, yeah, it fucking, I, what else can you say? I mean, I've talked about this before, other streams, you know, to not at nauseum, whatever, but it, it's just, it's just great, man. I love Alan, it. That was, that was almost my number one as well. That was like yeah. very, very close to being my number one, but I ended up, I don't know. I just, I was like, I'm just going to talk about these other movies, but I, I, man, I love the Hitcher. I'm right there with you. It, it's so, yeah, it's one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, those performances from both Howell and Rucker are just, they're insanely good. I mean, they just, they have to carry the whole movie, but yeah. that score too, man, I love that score to that film because it's so subtle, but it's, yeah. It's there, you know. It's very eerie and just I, I don't know. I love it. And there's so many cool shots, man. Like you know, of course, the, the opening scene, like I was saying in the car, you know, the thing a puncher in the eyeball, this kind of stuff. Then when he finally kicks him out of the car, you know, you can feel it's like a relief. Like, you know, he's fucked at this point. He's fucked. So he pushes him out of the car, or whatever. He he. And if I was him, I'd have fucking put the gas down. I would. I ain't stopping for nobody. Fuck anybody. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm getting out of the desert or where the fuck he was. Um. But that, that shot, whatever, the next morning, you know, where you see the stuffed animal in the back of the car. Yeah. And he reveals his face, whatever. It's such a classic yeah. shot, man. It's such a classic classic scene. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, it's, it's just so fucking good. But, Alan, what about the scene at the diner table where the, you know, the, the gun pointed at him? He's, yeah, he's yeah, like, he bangs the, the table. table. <laughs> click, click, click. Yeah, he starts he's like, pulling oh. the trigger. Yeah, he's like, it's not, it's not loaded. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you know, Rucker's fucking with him. It's like it's not loaded, <laughs> and he just starts clicking, clicking, clicking. And then I love he just takes out that little thing and just like puts all the bullets on the table. And he's like, "There you go. Now it's loaded. You know, go ahead. You know, and just disappears." I think, I think another reason why I like it so much is like, see, Thomas Howell's never done anything like this before. He's just coming off the Outsiders. This was like a big fucking step out for him. Well, you know, he does Red a fucking Dawn. great job. Like when he's in the cop car. You know, I would have ruined anything, but you know the thing I'm talking about. Yeah. He thinks he's gonna be okay. He's gonna turn himself in. And then what happens, happens. And when he gets out in the desert, he just falls down and like I'm fucking I'm done. You know, sticks a fucking gun under his chin, whatever, you know, and it's like I fuck it, I'm done. 
Yeah. You, know, you can feel what this motherfucker's going through. He, he plays it really well. well he's yeah. going through a lot of shit. The Even with the finger in the French fries and the fucking restaurant. Yeah. You feel all that, you don't see happening. You know? But, yeah, it's a rough couple of days for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Even when he kicks him out of the car, when he kicks Rutger out of the car at the beginning or whatever, and he just starts, he gets so excited. He's like, yeah, fuck you, motherfucker. And he just starts hitting the top. <laughs> fuck you, buddy. Oh, That's he's a, a bad guy ass, reaction. That's how a guy would do it. Because he'd be like, yeah, fuck you, motherfucker. What do you think of me yeah. now, bitch? And just kicks his ass out. See, I, that I was me. It. The movie's over with. Yeah. After that, because yeah. you ain't going to see my ass. I get to San Diego. I love that shit. Yeah. yeah. I watched I it with a with the commentary and the director uh, actually said that uh, while filming that scene, uh, I, I think it was like, it might've been like midway through production or something, but he told C Thomas Al to fucking like, uh, for this scene, he was like, just, just pretend that this is the last scene of production. And uh, like uh, that fucking reaction, he like, that's bro, the reaction you got from it. It's a great reaction, man. It's so realistic. Well, yeah. yeah. Solid flick, man. And I didn't realize in this last rewatch, whatever, but that sheriff at the very end, you know, the, the very like the last sheriff, the last scene, whatever the guy's been talking to on the Jeffrey Demun. Yeah, that, that's that's the guy from fucking Green Mile in one of the fucking uh uh that's, pressure officers, whatever on the Green Mile. That's Andre Chikatilo in Citizen X. Yeah, okay. it's like, also uh, Dale in The Walking Dead. Yeah, I damn it, damn sure is not it. Son yeah. of a bitch. Yeah, the damn sure is. Yeah. He's done the, he's been in everything that Darabont did. Yeah, he's I in like the mist. Well. Yep, he's in the mist too. Yeah, he's really young in the hitcher. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty young in uh, Citizen X too. Yeah, I'm gonna check Younger. that out. I got it on my list to watch. I'm gonna check it out for sure. It's a good watch, man. Okay, we're gonna finish up the chat. We've been going almost three hours, not bad. One of these. Yeah, so yeah. finish out the chat here and get on out of here. So let's see. Cal says, uh, Ray Ben telling y'all about code. Yeah. I that one. Ben says, Primal Fear is the underrated thriller. I watch Primal Fear. Um, I got more drama out of the thriller, but it's a great fucking movie. I've always loved that movie. That's I just awesome. got my 4K from um, Paramount Presents in today, matter of fact. Yeah. I was excited to see that getting a release. Another release, a better release. Cal says, Prestige is an awesome thriller. Yep. Yeah. 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 While Reynolds would need to see Nightmare Alley. I don't like the good one. <laughs> I, I got fucking notes on this movie, man. I, this almost made my list. Uh, number one is Arlington Road, 99 Thriller. It wasn't going to be my number one. It was, probably, it was at number three at one time. Um, Mark Pellington, uh, Jeff Bridges, Tim Robbins, Joan, Joan Cusack. I mean, Joan Cusack was perfectly cast as Tim Robbins' wife in this. Because she's kind of got that fucking, I'm, my cheese ain't quite off my cracker, but just don't fuck with me. Because it's yeah. almost She's got that down to a science. And she's perfect as fucking the crazy wife in this. You know, she's mm -hmm. this baby homemaker, but you can tell that, you know, don't fuck with her, you know, kind of thing. She she pulls that off well in this movie. Um, fear, paranoia, and, and, a, and a lethal conspiracy, a deadly mix. And Tim, and Tim Robbins, is, everybody, the whole cast is great in this. Oh, yeah. Um, but Tim Robbins plays the fucking guy next door. You ain't quite sure if he's a fucking psychopath or not. He, play, he, plays, it down, he plays it perfectly. Um. And this is another one. You better take your fucking anxiety meds for you watch it. Because fuck. Especially the last 30 months. It's, it's a good one, though. It was on my list just a few days ago. Uh, Chris is blown away. Jeff Bridges. I need to watch that one again. I haven't seen that in a long time. It's really good. Yeah, yeah that, really I can good. do that one, too. And I think that Arlington Road came out pretty close together in maybe the same couple years, same year, maybe. Tommy Lee Jones is so damn menacing in that movie. I need to see that again. I'm gonna see it. I think I say that me and my ex wife seen it when it first came out a um, long time ago. Uh, said he says, Follow down, great movie, four out of five. Give us your briefcase. <laughs> you forgot your briefcase. <laughs> I was a fan of Falling Down. Yeah. While Rango says, I showed it to her for the first time, actually. Oh, yeah. She nice. loved it. Yeah. Nice. Uh, while Rango says, learn from stormtroopers, can't hit jack shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Chris says, my number two is Thief, my number one training day. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Super ecstatic for that Thief one. Yeah. 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 I just get more of a crime, you know. Yeah. 100% crime to me. 
I still think Brad needs to get a fucking check from people that made Thief whatever. Oh, absolutely. I <laughs> bought it because of Brad. That, that's how. That's One why day. I bought it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They'll probably get a 4K soon, I would assume. Yeah, Callis says American Gangster is good, and he's also a fan of Training Day. I love Training Day. Love. That's probably my, my favorite Denzel movie of all times I've ever seen. Mine too. And I've got I've like a bunch of his, but I really, really like that one. Let's see. Chris says Training Day is my top 10. All time Sparrow Creek, uh, 3.5 out of 5. Good movie. Well, there you go. Uh, Trey says, pulling up at McDonald's at 10 55 a.m., they tell you no more breakfast. <laughs> Man, motherfucker, I know. <laughs> Sons of bitches. Call it down, great pick, Anthony. Uh, Chris e says, I get stuck in traffic and he explains to the kid what, what they are really doing. Mm. Make me so think I've seen it at Dollar Tree. It probably is at Dollar Tree, standing off of Sparrow Creek. It's just not. Was not a good seller at all. Oh, Chris says, hit your great pick, Pops. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hit your remake wasn't bad at all either. The the dismember scene was crazy. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's not to rewatch the ride. i the remake in a lot of years. I need to rewatch the remake. Uh, Chris says, great top it's five as always. Well. Jens, appreciate it, buddy. Little, it's a little too girl-oriented, the remake. I, I agree. Like it. Yeah. And also, I appreciate the training. Well, guys, we're going to get on out of here. Um, y'all got anything y'all want to talk about before we get out? Got to. No, nothing. Yeah, everybody go hunt some bucket eggs tomorrow. Um, anyway, um, I'll be on Dead Pit stream tomorrow night. I think it starts at 10 o'clock. That's late for me on Sunday night. But I'll be on Dead Pit. We're going through year – It's, it's year. It's, I think it's year seven. It's 2018, 2019. Um going through all the releases that Scream Factory did for that year. So I'll be on that tomorrow night at 10. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll have some more shit coming up soon. So that's what I got going on. Yep. But I will um, talk to you guys later. Everybody have a happy Easter and all that shit. Absolutely. I'll see y'all next time. Later on. Yeah.